Post 63, which has uh, completely saved the day for us because the venue we'd chosen had a COVID issue, so we couldn't uh, broadcast there. So the American Legion uh, Post 63 in Salem is to thank for us to being able to do this in person. Yay. That would be Tim. So you guys have all heard me speak before and do, um, well, gosh knows how many interviews now. I think almost 200. So this is a chance for you to see what I've been talking about. And everybody wants to go straight from, there are two places to go. One is uh, what is our ancient past and what is it all about? And what was our, um, what, are the, what is this interaction we're all having with UFOs? Why is the US government, why is the United States military, Air Force, Navy pointing out that, yeah, we actually have UFOs. The premise for my book, It's Not Aliens, Worse It's Us, is that there is a lost ancient advanced human civilization. And it is likely that those remnant people survived and rebuilt their society and those tic-tac UFOs or that, and I'm not saying specifically them, but there are a number of things that could be a reasoning why we are seeing them here on our planet, that they're not from interdimensional space travel, that they're not from somewhere else, that they're actually from here. And the, to build the argument, I've gone at it a, a few different ways, and we are going to kind of do a smash crash course through history again. And we're going to start, of all the things, this is usually an ancillary object pointed out in retrospect. These stone spheres are found uh, first, well, they're found all over the world, but the, the, this is Costa Rica. And the woman, uh, Miss Stone here, standing next to this giant stone sphere, uh, these are found from the Arctic Circle to uh, New Zealand. And they are found all the way down to the size of golf balls. And one of the things that are pointed out is that they're not perfectly round. Well, we'll get to all that. But these stone spheres, Terra Preta, which I've talked about over and over, is an engineered soil. It's an ancient engineered soil. It is found, and, and this gentleman is standing in front of a site with uh, pottery shards that go down to the ground. And in the area of New England that we're in, about an inch of soil equals about um, 100, 150 years. But this is an engineered soil. This is like a potting soil. This is a soil that is made by man. And just in the Amazon basin, they estimate currently that there's an area twice the size of Spain. This identical soil it has components that make it an exact recipe. This exact soil is found in Northern uh, South America, Northern Africa. It's found in uh, specifically Australia, Siberia, Eastern Europe, and in the Americas. And it's also called Chernozems. And biochars are the modern term, and we've talked about this, but they're found all over the earth. And usually this is a secondary point again. We started with stone spheres, but here's keystone cuts. And you can see from the video that these are seen in Egypt, Iran, Cambodia, Bolivia, Ethiopia, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, Egypt, all over the world. These keystone cuts connect something. And what they connect is this, polygonal construction. We're gonna go over all of this. And the reason is, is that we wanna find mummies, we wanna find ancient items, but here is something that you see that is incredibly complex. These stones have been fit together on every side. There are no room for blades of grass, needles. They are fit this tight on every side and you can see the nubs. That's something that everybody should watch for. The, the nubs are found everywhere in the world, along with keystone cuts, along with stone spheres, along with terra preta. Again, it's not sexy. Ancient engineered soil, not interesting. So why are we looking at Doggerland? Instead of, I have a big map of the world that we're gonna look at, but why is Doggerland important? Because even 7,000 years ago in the time of Gobekli Tepe, all these rivers, all this, this is the land at 16,000 years ago, at 8,000 years ago, Gobekli Tepe at a minimum is 12,000 to 16,000 years old. At 12 to 16,000 years old, uh, this is the snapshot of just one place on earth that there was a human civilization 
living on these coastlines that no longer exist because they're underwater. And why is that important? The reason that's important is because besides a world map that would be more accurate. Now, mind you, this map is to 16,000 years old. This is a city off the coast of Cuba. It is 2,300 feet deep. It's 1,700 meters below the sea. This is a picture taken by a group of uh, treasure hunters. They were given authorization by Fidel Castro. It's been about 15 years now. No work has been done on this site. Of course, it's incredibly difficult to get to. Marine archaeology is where it's at. It's the most dangerous kind of work. It's incredibly challenging, not just from the pressure, but from currents. And this is a city that could have only been above ground over 50,000 years ago, above water. So here we are with a map of Doggerland that gave you 16,000 years ago. But to zoom in for everyone, here's Doggerland and here's Cuba. That city is right here. And for everyone listening, that would be uh, the west coast of Cuba. But this city and Doggerland, you can see here, these are the missing land masses when that city was above water. And those stone spheres and that polygonal construction would be all over the world. Everything you saw, those stone spheres would exist everywhere. And that means we're looking at a global world and a coastline that is not what we look at today. When we look at the world history and we tell ourselves, this is the world history. Well, this is, this is the general estimates of not only the same map, now overlaid with the missing landmass, but this is Terra Preta and Chernozems. The Chernozems are in green. Um, there's, in, when I went paleo, South America was exporting Ill illegally Terra Preta. But in Ukraine, there's also an engineered soil. And the Chernozems in Ukraine are estimated to be uh, exported to over $100 million a year. And that's not the only location. You can see in Australia, that they, they're in Australia, they're in America. And so the snapshot when you build up an ancient lost society changes when you start seeing a true world map of where everything is, which brings us back to stone spheres. Every red dot is a stone sphere. Well, not one, but many. So now the blue dots are terra preta. The most sacred thing on Easter Island a lot of people never actually see where Easter Island is. But Easter Island, the holiest thing for the people of Rapa Nui is a stone sphere. And Easter Island also has polygonal walls. It also has polygonal construction and stone spheres in Australia. Now, these two are actually pretty close together. But there's Costa Rica where we started. And the reality is that this society wasn't of all the places to go, because I know we're going to get to sexy mummies and really cool Tutankhamun stuff, because who doesn't want to see that? But this is what polygonal construction, stone spheres, keystone cuts are all about. This is modern uh, science looking at exactly what it says. Uh, they're going to build a skyscraper on a platform. If you build it on a platform, the idea is, well, when it gets hit by an earthquake, well, it's going to move. It's going to bend. So there's a science behind making a building not shake. It, when you ritualize and you look at history primitively, you're not seeing the higher advanced sciences, archaeoacoustics, uh, nanoarchaeology. They're all becoming a thing now. But what we're looking at right now is modern construction methods and how they manage and, and deal with vibrational signals, including Egan, structure, you know, Egan values, which is exactly what the great pyramids, ziggurats, and you name it, are built on. They use Egan values. These are all things that are done uh, to stop earthquakes, uh, to measure a building and build it seismically so that instead of it being a wet noodle, by using, this is a, the Wiggly building is standing on a traditional block foundation. This represents nanostructures. And there's a lot of words down here and the Egan modes, Egan values, and what they're talking about is uh, the idea of a building being able to mute 
the, or cancel earthquake waves by having small seismic metastructures is what we're talking about here. And that's what they've discovered stone spheres are. They're seismic metastructures. And not only that, but so is polygonal walls. They move with earthquakes. And that was figured out by uh, traditional archeology. span And now we have Terra Preta. It's not just a great growing soil. What they describe here are everything from nano-sized particles to large, I mean, large, basically, I don't know if you want to call them Legos or more like Capsellos. I'm dating myself. But the idea of placing hollowed, uh, honeycombed structures that reflect, mute, resonate, or transfer waves and frequencies. And that, th that is very different. If we didn't have any examples uh, when we think of how we look at ancient structures, but there was a study done and this was published and it was featured in um, Ancient Origins, but what you're looking at right now, this is what we call Greco-Roman amphitheaters. And once they studied it in the pylon placement of the uh, structures that the superstructure sits on, it has wave muting cancellating features. It does the same thing. So th it, it, there's a good possibility that Greco-Roman amphitheaters along with other ancient structures like anything else that was built polygonal, which includes the, the Greeks. The Greeks say we inherited uh, the Temple of Delphi. We inherited this from the gods, the gods built it. Uh, the Inca, same deal, Machu Picchu, who, you know, who built this? Well, the gods built it. It's always the gods. So we get far enough away from a society and then we lose track and then we're busy calling things the temple, the moon, the star, the wonder of this, that, or the other. And before you know it, you're not looking at structures scientifically. You're not, you're, you're going as far as we can understand them. And beyond polygonal walls and stone spheres and engineered soil, which self-replicates, it's the richest growing soil on earth. Ooh, you would think there's enough about the Great Pyramid, right? So for everyone to look, it rarely gets pointed out. You see the seams? Mm -hmm. It's an eight-sided pyramid. And now that's the Great Pyramid. A lot of people think the Great Pyramid's in the middle. The Great Pyramid is not the center pyramid. Um, Menkari of the three, do you see the same lines? So it was a Air Force pilot. It was a British Air Force pilot that noticed that as the sun rose or set, that you could actually see that this is an eight-sided pyramid. Now, when we start right away with this conversation of it being about cymatic, polygonal, wave frequency canceling, transmitting. I'm bringing up earthquakes because we can all get our heads around, oh yeah, earthquakes, earthquakes bad. Let's not have earthquakes. Let's have seismic metastructures that are built under uh, the foundations of buildings and let's use stone spheres. How stone spheres were used, we're gonna go over, but it's not, um, again, that's not what people wanna find. Uh, the problem is that we have dynastically looked and polygonal walls, like the ones here in Japan, uh, they got used just like, in, just like here in Japan, you're seeing a temple or a castle, this is a castle, built on polygonal walls. I can show you the same constructions in Peru. I mean, we could spend a whole conversation and a whole, we could just go through and flip through photos of everywhere in the world that has the identical construction. But again, you have polygonal walls, cymatic construction, all stopping earthquakes for structures that are missing. But after tens of thousands of years of de-evolution of, or, or re-adaptation of, of a site and then repair work and maintenance, you have a, a new interpretation. It's hard not to see that when you're, when, it's hard to see what it once was when it's already been something else. It's, th this is what we need to go back to. We need to start with very blank slate uh, pictures. Oh yeah, there we go. This, this, this is what we should start with when you walk to a site 
and interdisciplinary archaeoacoustics. There are, uh, so we're going to go to America's Stonehenge today. And part of going to America's Stonehenge is looking at how ne Neolithic and megalithic uh, societies are different. Megalithic, the original builders, are high technology. Neolithic, Eolithic, uh, people who are literally banging rocks together and placing things very simply, those are people using stones that they could quickly quarry, sites that they've come across that that whole city that's underwater, well, it went underwater due to an incredible deluge. Now, was that the Younger Dryas that happened 11 to 13,000 years ago? Or did that city go underwater maybe prior in the 60 to 75,000 year range? And so now we have a society that comes in and makes a four-sided pyramid or repairs it. And they didn't even use, there's this assumption that the dynastic Egyptians, even in the six and a half thousand years that we give them credit for, yet the Egyptians themselves said they were around for 36,000 years. And, and I mean dynastic Egyptians, I mean primitive people who came in and found destroyed cities. They didn't have full access to all of Egypt. It wasn't like every ruin in Egypt wasn't the dynastic Egyptians that they even were able to readapt and use. We're assuming that they did. But even the latest studies now are showing Northern Africa was probably tropical even 6,000 years ago. So now think Doggerland, tropical paradise, massive lakes that we can see from geosatellites like I showed you the lakes in Northern Africa. But this is, this is where we're dealing, this is what we're dealing with now for um, uh, <clears throat> our, our interpretations from ruins it's hard for us to not to see the Greeks, the Romans. Um, we, we have a lot of interpretations of ruins now. We don't see eight-sided pyramids. We don't see stone spheres as related. We don't study Egan values. We are left, I mean, lo look at what archeologists have to deal with. I'm not against anyone who's an archeologist. I've said it before, but look at what they're dealing with. And having been a historical remodeler for almost 20 years, um, people don't build like this. And what I mean is, is that yes, the place is a mess, but, and, and obviously things have been broken off, but look at the way it's stacked. I, I, I am old enough to have played with wooden blocks. This looks like someone stacked wooden blocks and we're going to see a lot more of that. Sites that were devastated, that were used, and then they were moved. And that's what we're left with. We don't have the finish work. Egyptologists, archeologists of a certain tradition, they didn't have access to equipment and measuring and interpretations beyond everything's a ritual, everything's a, some sort of a, just, just a, it's, it has to do with some fertility goddess or something and they, they're not looking at the constructions with the tools and the machinery that's necessary to create the measurements. This structure, by the way, is set in a granite plug. They carved out and set the pyramid in a plug. It's set like a, like a cap in a, in, a, in a set stone, like for jewelry. That's how the Great Pyramid is actually set. And the pyramid itself, has polygonal nubs and construction, identical to what we saw earlier, and we're gonna see it soon. But this isn't, uh, again, this isn't standard archeology. span it's, it's this. And we're only gonna spend a couple minutes on this because who doesn't, I mean, you don't, you, some of you may recognize this, some of you may not. And the issue right now is who doesn't wanna be this guy? Harold Cart. And I'm sure, again, I mentioned it earlier, so you probably already know what this is. But Egypt, whether it's South America or Egypt, who doesn't want to be this guy? There's King Tut. You have an undisturbed tomb, toys. I mean, this is cool. Who doesn't want to be, I mean, it, it is so quick and easy for all of us based on our programming and our life and growing up that we've seen shows where, look, look at this, this is cool, right? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at it in color. 
the, the, this is what every archaeologist is dream of. Who doesn't want to find this? You have items, household items, little seats, undisturbed. Um, it, it's incredible. This is where people's focuses end up. Who knows what, you know, here's, here's again um, what it looked like uncolored. I mean, look at the detail on the chariot. This is exciting. This is fun. I mean, it, it conjures up, uh, you know, Moses and, and Hollywood Moses. And, and here we are with uh, trunks, cases of, uh, it, there, there are so many incredible, incredible uh, finds here that you can spend a lifetime just in this one tomb. And that's also a problem in archaeology is that they spend just their whole life I mean, this thing looks brand new. It, it's incredible what gold does, but was that gold part of a nanotechnology uh, radio frequency controller from a lost ancient high technology uh, machine that got melted down into a mask? Or had it already been done that? Uh, you know, had they already repurposed it, readapted it 10 different times before this mask was made? Those are things that right now we speculate on and then we say we have no answers, which is really interesting because this is not sexy based on what you just saw. Who wants to, uh, who, what soil scientists want to look at this and say, hey, I want a really good growing soil. Uh, nobody looks at this if you have a choice and you want to spend a lifetime, 100 years so far, soil scientists can't replicate bi this biochar. They don't understand why it has piezoelectric properties. Oh, by the way, it filters heavy metals and carbon dioxide. And that means that if you have a world that you're trying to deal with carbon emissions, uh, why isn't anyone even in the mainstream talking about ancient soils that already did it? Our assumption when we look at soils is that they were using them for uh, just growing food. And then on top of it, most of the minerals you want in food, which are over 50, like if you know Dr. Joe Wallach and you know the 90 for life vitamin guy, there are 60 nutrients or more that you could put in the soil. And we don't grow like that. We have 16, 17, we wing it, we do soil rotation. And that we make an assumption on, we, like that we know about soil rotation. We invented soil rotation, ironically, in Minnesota, the Kelly farm. You can go check it out. And then after the Civil War, um, Kelly was brought down and they taught the South soil rotation and uh, for crop rotation, for soil uh, richness. But we're talking 16, 17 minerals. We're not talking hundreds and having the richest food on earth. That's, when you have a nutrient-dense food, you don't get cancer. I mean... I'm not saying it's a guarantee. I'm just saying that if you actually have a nutrient rich food, what's the point of eating something that looks like a big red tomato when it's made in Florida and sand and it has seven nutrients or, or whatever versus something that's grown in a soil like this. But that's not Harold. That's, that's not Tutankhamun. This is sexy. I mean, who doesn't want to be this guy? Look at the hat. I mean, I mean, look at the shoes. The guy went and did archaeology. People make fun of me for wearing flip-flops to American Stonehenge. And this guy's in, look at those. Those are white. I don't care if it's black and white. Those are, look at those shoes. Um, which brings us to the sexy subject of art history. This is the problem with all archaeology. People want this statue for their mantle. Victorians and uh, for as long as we can remember from the Dark Ages when Rome went away, uh, one, you have the Romans copying everything the Greeks did. The Greeks were once maybe part of the Etruscans, and the Etruscans, which is a made-up name, a lot like the Clovis, are likely uh, Tartarians. And we're talking about an empire that spanned from Malta and Sardinia and all of Middle Spain to likely all of Siberia. But here we are with a statue. This is art history. The whole point was throw away the bones. We don't need bones. Not to mention there's plenty of reports of archeologists. They would dig an old bone up and it would turn to dust. And so they're like, well, screw it. We lost it. It's in the dust. It's in the dirt. Forget it. So the point of digging something like this up, because Victorians really liked archaeology. Here we have museum work. You know, this is now in the period by the time Carter is doing Tutankhamun, you have them. I mean, the, somebody could spend a lifetime and a doctorate in each one of these trunks, on the trunk, about the trunk. This is, this is, this is archaeology when it became modernized and it was about the societies this everybody see the statues 
this is why archaeology it wasn't called archaeology i never understood as a as a when i was uh my first art history class i'm like oh it's history class but wait it's art it's it always confused me i never understood it this is where the statues went that they dug up i mean look at the vase I mean, it doesn't matter if the person in this original photo was doing replicas or not. I mean, you can see a Chinese umbrella. You can see this is very bohemian now, but this is a Victorian home. This is period. And did they collect things? I don't think it can be clear what you do when you don't have cable until you see the average Victorian home. And here we are, you know, we're a solid hundred years, you know, 1850s, you have Darwin. You have a number of other theories about not just evolution, but uh, Darwin wasn't a set stone. It wasn't like there was a big vote and said, let's all agree that it was Darwin. The issue is theories are different than facts and throwing out facts to fit theories are what we're going to deconstruct. But again, just to really pound the point home about how did people collect things and when they're going after uh, objects, they weren't interested in objects for uh, science. The whole point of early archeology span in the 16, 1700s when they were finding things in even large sites like Stonehenge, they were just collecting it and putting it on a shelf. And that's not archeology. span And then early archeology, span they're pounding stuff out. And that brings us to what was the point of early archeology? span Well, everything was a temple. And I don't think anything represents like a constant Christmas holiday festival than this painting. I just, I just like this. This is the image that all archaeologists, okay, and by the way, not every, every archaeologist, I'm a big advocate, advocate of archaeology. You need to be paid to fail. You need to not lose your funding. Archaeologists need to be able to find what they find and the facts if they don't fit the theories. Archaeologists need to be continued to be funded and boldly go literally where no one's been allowed to go. This has to stop being the archaeological um, storyboard. We have to not tell these ritualistic stories that, you know, everyone's put on their Sunday best in this photo and everybody's going to, of course, temple to worship because that's the only reason you build anything. It's because it's, you got to worship. You know, there is no, there's nothing else, which brings us back to stone spheres. There's a lot of interesting things about these. I showed you a little bit of the science behind them. She found not just a couple, they did a couple expeditions. Uh, they found a lot. And like I said, these don't even go down to ball size or down to golf ball. They are hollow. They are made out of different materials. No one's done material science research on there. If you want to write something down for things to do, no material science has been done on these. We don't know. The, the, the geological term is that they are uh, concretions. So for a period of time, volcanoes decided it was trendy to make snowballs of stone. That's literally the explanation. Now, there are natural concretions, but these, and it gets pointed out, well, they're not perfectly round. Well, they're not perfectly round because one, they've been weathered for tens of thousands of years. Two, I don't think they're perfectly round because depending on the Egan value, the wave or the frequency you are muting, you are gonna have a different kind of ball and a different size. Are these all underground balls or are some of these balls on some sort of frequency light post? That's, that's therein lies the issue. And <clears throat> getting back to size, Here's a big one. They were literally finding these with steam cranes. This is Costa Rica. Oh, come on. Here we go. They're getting bigger. This is also Costa Rica. And look at the colors in it. So. The idea dynastically, because everything's a temple and everything looks like that Roman village that we just saw, uh, they made these to bury with important chiefs. That's the explanation, important chiefs. So this is Bosnia, 64 tons. And it has layers on it still. 
So the question is, what do each of the layers represent and how do we, oh, by the way, we'll get to how we know they're hollow because whether it's Mexico, whether it's Costa Rica, whether it's New Zealand, uh, there was some ideas that there would be, it never fails. There must be gold or treasure in them. So people started to pick at them with great difficulty and then they even blew them up and cracked them open. So we can't pound this home enough. Here we go. Abandoned nuclear facility. How long, how many thousands of years, how many, how long until the only thing left is the stone, the foundation? And how long before you look at something like this and you don't know that it was a nuclear facility? We don't, we, we spend so much time saying the word ritual and fertility goddess that we don't see the technology of the past. We look at this and we go, we know what this is. Well, now how hard is it to tell what the hell it is? When you give it, when you give it perspective, this drives me nuts. This turns into this. And who isn't in love with Lord of the Rings? I'm not going to say no. We have genetic memory. But look, look at what we're dealing with. You just have to picture these people there. You know, if you do yoga for a thousand years, I keep saying it, you do yoga for a thousand years at Chernobyl, it's a thing. Anybody who does anything for a thousand years, it's a thing. So you can't say no to the people who do yoga every, you know, for, for a thousand years, and you still have to tell them that they've been doing it at a nuclear plant. But it, it matters. The Druids matter. Uh, different periods of human history matter. But wearing a costume at a site doesn't get you to this. This is the same scientist doing the same work with stone spheres. So in a modern experiment, they took one meter by one meter stone spheres and they hit it with waves and then they cut the stones. So we're talking a decent sized stone sphere. And what they started figuring out was what are the stresses? Can you imagine if this is hollow? How would that wave be absorbed? And how, <clears throat> how would that wave expand? How would it cancel itself or how would it reverberate through the stone sphere? And what does that get you? That gets you to, as they say here, schematic, not to scale. This is a representation of a seismic wave shield consisting of a periodic array. I know everyone listening and everyone watching can read it for themselves. But when, I say, when they say split ball resonators, because you're not looking at the full report, they are using those stone spheres, those one meter by one meter stone spheres. They've sliced them like a piece of cake and they've reattached them with um, steel rods. But this is what those stone spheres were for. They didn't protect a single home, they protected whole cityscapes. And we look at these things and so one of the great things about everybody doing alternative research and everybody looking into this is that everyone's like, there's stone spheres all over the earth. That's interesting. Yeah, but what about the material sciences? What about the physicists? What about the forensic geologists? What about the work as a builder, as a construction person? What am I seeing? And it doesn't make sense. They're not ritualistic. They're not an old Roman city with a bunch of people who are celebrating, I don't know, fill in the day pagan, you know, skin something else and, you know, have a bloodletting table. This is something entirely different. And you can see it here. They have layers of stone spheres. And that's exactly what was being found in Costa Rica. It's what's found when they went to build the train trolleys in San Francisco. They call, uh, David Hatcher Childress likes to point out that they were called dinosaur eggs. <laughs> they thought they were dinosaur eggs. This is original work. They literally thought, yeah, we're finding dinosaur eggs. But okay. So here's, here's New Zealand. And here's our first cracked, here's our first cracked egg. And you've already seen from the earlier map, and we'll get back to it, they're all over the earth. And this is not the coastline. It is now. But you're looking at, due to wind and weathering, we always think soil layers. 
well, what if it's in an area where soil is constantly being pulled away by tide and it's being uh, transferred down a coast? So you're looking at stone spheres that would have been mid, mid New Zealand. By the way, there's also polygonal construction all over New Zealand. So these would have been buried and how deep and how many constructions would have been above it. We don't know. And then some are hollow. You can see some of the shapes. They, and the s same thing was done in Bosnia. Same thing happened in uh, South America where again, they're busting into them looking for treasure. Here's another angle. And they're old. We can't date stone. That's a problem. Oh, I love this one. It's very pretty. It's about the size of that one that you saw with the gal standing next to it. It's a little bit smaller than that. This one's in the Arctic. And they have more than that. But that's in Russia. So basically North Pole. And because the poles weren't where they were. I like this one. It's very swirly. This is China. And by the way, there are many in China. They actually set them outside of doorways, like pumpkins. <laughs> and, and again, out of context, you know, what is it? it? It doesn't make sense to people. And let's go back and take a minute and take a look. So again, we have stone spheres. That one you were looking at, it's right there. That, that one that was, uh, uh, the, the one that I said was in the Arctic. And then the ones that you were looking at in New Zealand, that's where they were. Now, the interesting ones, uh, the, the ones that I just pointed out about New Zealand, uh, this continental area is called New Zealandia. Now, there are articles that discuss all of New Zealandia being there 250 million years ago. My most suspect portion, this took me, of, of, the, of the three and a half years on my book, two and a half years were spent piecing maps together to find what would match the city off of Cuba, what would match the world, Doggerland for sure. Lumeria is the only suspect. Now, not the extensive area around, around India, but this area, I don't know. That's the only thing on my map that I don't trust. I threw it in there because so many people have a theory about Lumeria that uh, the land of uh, whatever, it's, it's just suspect. But not the area around Australia, not, not all this, not New Zealandia, none of this, all of, like the Bimini Road in the Caribbean, all this existed for real. And even in the 90s, uh, Graham Hancock dived off the west coast of India. And we're talking, there's stuff that could have not been above water at a minimum 30 to 40,000 years ago. That's where the city is. There's stories of Krishna settled a city. And, and then again, we have the oldest records on earth being the Hindu Vedas, not the Christian Bible, but they, they were doing excavations and it's high current, murky water, can't see anything. But again, marine archeology span is really hard. You build the theory and the story of all of humanity from what's only above water, well, you know, you miss all the stone spheres, the whole sunken cities, and all of them showing advanced polygonal keystone cut, stone sphered um, construction, and more importantly, something that nobody wants to look at compared to mummies, engineered soil. All those blue dots indicate known current, no, current maps of engineered soil. How do you have the identical engineered soil in the Amazon basin and in Africa it, and in Australia? the same version. So it's Coca-Cola on three continents that weren't supposed to be talking dating at least 6,000 years ago. How do you do that if, they were, if there was no one traveling, just dynastically, just in the last 6,000 years? It's not a story, um, to quote David Hatcher Childress, mainstream science has to explain this. And this, this is what, Again, another detailed image of those stone spheres. When you start thinking of the complexity of what these stone spheres do, you're looking at stress points of how the values of waves and frequencies interact with the stone sphere. This is, uh, these are six scientists in Europe doing this work. There is recent work being done in Stanford that I don't even have papers on. It's been quoted to me over interviews. Uh, 
with HC Productions just recently. And so there's more work on this. And, and, and here you can see the split values. You can see how they split the spheres. And they were experimenting. They're using uh, space steel ligaments. So again, it's creating giant stone spheres that go under buildings that help stop earthquakes. But seismic metamaterials can be as simple as sifted dust. And, it, and the value of these waves are you're measuring under the building and wherever you think the tectonic plate is, shifting, flipping, bending, pushing, creating a frequency and a wave that travels to your building or city. And they weren't just doing it with stone spheres, they were doing it with city layouts. The city of Bologna, Italy, which I'm, I don't have a map of, the city of Bologna, Italy has the same layout in those towers. There was two to three, 400 foot towers. And the issue is, if they're creating earthquake muting locations, that the towers themselves are muting. So they're, they're working below ground. They're working within the polygonal constructions. And what they noted, even by these scientists doing this cymatic polygonal and stone sphere work, they were using the layouts of trees. So where you plant a tree, how the soil is formed and sifted, the thickness and density, think like when you sift flour. So they're managing the thickness of not only growing soil, but they're managing the ship. The, the, they've experimented with this now, putting plugs in the earth of just pulling out dirt and sand and saying, if you cheese grade the earth like a checkerboard, and if you plant trees, you can create echoing areas where like this building would be in a mute zone. You could have an, you could have a, an eight on the Richter scale and it would literally not touch this building because of the way they lay out the soil, the trees, the stone spheres and the polygonal construction, all of it together or one, depending on the area. And we're, again, I'm talking about earthquakes as we can all get our heads around that. But what I'm not talking about is communications. I'm not talking about the technologies. You have a society that's managing and engineering soil there and they understand waves and frequencies. The, well, they understand a lot more because of the building materials that they're working with. They're working with really large constructions and that, that therein lies the issue is that if you have a society that is using this level of technology with stone spheres that are in the Arctic circle with cities off the coast of Cuba that it's not like they, again, I've said it before, they didn't build the city and go, we're ready for the deluge, you know, let's go. I mean, thank God it's done. Nobody will know what this is for 50,000 years. Ha ha, LOL. So they do this, they do this kind of frequency wave management. They're building with keystone cuts. This is Egypt. This is a floor that everybody walk, gets to walk on. Why do you need to connect a building if it isn't about wave and frequency communication? If we already know that you go barefoot and you have an electron discharge, we don't look at the human body. Well, we know it's a conductor. Poor bastard is getting electrocuted every time of, you know, it floods and a power line goes down. You know, it happens even recently. And now you have an entire polygonal interconnected stone floor and not just stone floor, we're not talking small blocks. Sometimes like the pyramid area outside of the great, uh, like outside of the great pyramid itself. I want to stop saying Giza plateau to everyone. Cause when you say Giza plateau, everyone thinks the three pyramids, the Giza plateau is more like a County or a few counties. It represents hundreds of square miles of cities and locations. The Giza plateau is not just three pyramids, but the pyramid complex has megalithic stone blocks like Baalbek. Why do you need metal between them? They're not going anywhere. They're not moving. There has to be another discipline. No material scientists again, anyone who's into material science, no one's tested the construction of stone spheres, the layering, are they geopolymers? Are these keystone cuts? Because we have the keystones. We have other locations around the world that we've seen these, but we have the metal. So here you go. The, 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 this is some of the metal that's been found that was not plied away and maybe sharpened for an arrowhead or a knife or something. Uh, again, it's metal. We don't know, we, we kind of know what it is. I mean, they're, they're labeling them, 
but there has been no material science on this. And what is the conductivity between the stones? They're always using quartzites, they're always using limestones, there's always, they're always using basalts, but they're always using them together. Combine it with the soil that we started with, the stone spheres, and this, we have a different level of technology being used that is not being appreciated. And it's one thing if we had one of these objects, uh, this is like a giant, I, I keep pointing out it's a giant adult game of Clue. It makes more sense when you see it, right? It's not, it's just not uh, possible. So let's just say it's not Younger Dryas. Let's just say, let's say it's uh, 70,000 years ago or 80. Or let's just say the society that fell didn't completely fall till the Younger Dryas. Along come the Greeks. What are we doing with keystone cuts on the side of the building? It looks like a Lego, right? <laughs> Those are keystone cuts on a Greek temple that are not horizontal anymore. They're vertical. Why, why are there keystone cuts unless you have a giant worldwide society that has fallen through some either catastrophic event or war? Uh, their society lay either uh, 2,300 feet below the water or below water, or now uh, they lay in ruins and they're scattered survivors. And what we know is Denisovan, Neanderthal, and a mystery 14% human all combine and mix about, we know this, 50 to 60,000 years ago. And of 50 to 60,000 years ago, you could say that these are survivors that have been left on the planet. And here is this remnant uh, construction, and someone's going to build a temple dynastically, as in the Greeks. So now you take a keystone cut, and you use that piece, and now you're building a temple. But that piece looks like it wasn't on its side. I mean, on originally, it's now tilted up, but it, it would have been flat. So now we're back to keystone cuts all over, everywhere. Again, Pumapunku, Egypt, Greece, Tunisia. I mean, you just saw the Tunisian keystone cut. I just showed you the floor in Egypt. And this is, oop. so th this is what I can't get to enough. When we look at this and, okay, let's get romantic. Here we go. We just found Tutankhamun and we are rebuilding the story of Egypt. And we have that really great picture in our head of that Roman Renaissance photo, that romance of this period. And everyone's sweeping around in silk robes and Cleopatra is about to have another kid. So this is a first time construction, right? Uh, this picture is courtesy of Jennifer Dale. Uh, I mean, there's no way they rebuilt this, right? What are those? Those big square blocks, although quite buildable by the Egyptians, uh, they're big. I mean, they're really big. But that's a keystone cut. Egypt everywhere has buildings. It's the same diamond keystone. They're everywhere, all over Egypt, all over the world are keystone cuts. Again, dynastic peoples, very bright people. They work some things out they built this temple. So if we know that there's a highly advanced Egan valued wave frequency society and they had really great constructions that lasted a really long time, but then were found look really useful on top. Right. But is that the original construction? Those are pieces that they found and Tanis, which was the old capital of Egypt, it's obliterated. Most people don't go visit Tanis. Brian Forrester, uh, Uncharted X, Ben, uh, a number of people like to have been showing video, really great video. You should check them out. But the video that they show of going to Tanis are megalithic pieces of 
these, um, these bits. Some of these are dynastic, these columns, but some of these florets, I mean, they're like just the floret top. It's a single piece of stone. And you can see the cuts, the section here. The Egyptians can do that. The Greeks can do that. Everybody can build in a section. In Tanis and in other locations in Egypt, and there's a good chance that they may have just found that and cut it. There are whole columns that are single piece stones. And the florets are so precision cut that it looks again like Christopher Dunn, the engineer has pointed out that they've been engineered. They are not hand done, they're not hand hewn. But this is also not thousands, but tens of thousands of years of weathering. You have the Lego blocks restacked. So there are a couple of questions, at least if I was looking at this as an Egyptologist and I wanted to take this seriously and really look at it with all material sciences, am I looking at a, a column that was actually mimicked by the Egyptians? Like this is one that they found. This is one that they made. Notice how they're all different tops. They could have been from different temples, but did they, did they make each of these? or did they build one to fill in for the ones that were missing? Did they cut these up from taller columns? Did they build them themselves? Did they add on? We, th those are the questions, because one thing's for sure. They don't know what to do with keystone cuts. They added those two blocks together because at one point those two blocks did fit together. And now it's the top of a temple. Oh, look. 1832, everyone's leaving their mark. And that's not the only people who did it. The Greek, the Romans did it, the Greeks did it, anybody who traveled, uh, even um, there were some pharaohs, like the reconstruction of the Sphinx, there was dynastic uh, remodeling. So I have talked forever about being someone who's done historical remodeling, and this is Baalbek. And we just talked about, I'm trying to paint a picture for you of tens of thousands of years old advanced society falling, people coming along and doing work. So here is, I, I, I want you to look of all the things to look at besides this being a hodgepodge of blocks. Do you see the Lego section? Do you see the, the see how there's a, an edge? It's a block with a face on it. You, you can see them. Um, like there, you, you can see the squares. They have, a, they have a face that's slightly out. But then um, this is one of, this is Baalbek. And that's a single stone. There, there are sections here, but this is a single stone. This is one of the, they call them the trilithons. The other way to hide and mute something is to give it a fancy name, like Stone of the Pregnant Mother, which they literally have at this site. Um, and we jump right to the megalithic blocks, but I want you to pay attention. To those are single piece columns in the back. When I told you that the Egyptians built them in pieces, now, the, the Greeks, Romans, everybody that they give credit for doing this other than some mystery people, there was over 200 columns still intact when this site was being modernly excavated. There aren't as many, but not all of these are single column. They were rebuilds. But of the ones that are single columns, they had to cut them right, right down to the Corinthian you know, right down to the details, that's, that's, that's a single column and they're 60 feet tall. And the, the size of these are where you guys are. I mean, they're, they're over 12 feet. I mean, they're, that, those are incredible columns. Someone had to spin that and they're perfectly of, you know, the dimensions on them. And, and also somebody would have to, like Christopher Dunn, we would have to put engineering instruments to find what the surface topography is to find out how many imperfections is it is it smooth down to thousands of an inch because there are plenty of boxes in Egypt that are smoothed down to the thousands and yeah okay this place is old it's a mess you can see the grass growing in it but what we're looking for 
is signs of, was this how this thing was originally built or does it appear to you to be more uh, reconstructed? Was it that there was once an advanced society that not only had to be abandoned and destroyed, but how long until those cars rest away? How long before the glass, the metal, the exterior, we look at these large megalithic buildings and we keep like that temple we looked at, we look at that and we go, yeah, they, they painted the block and they all wore silk and the end. We don't look at these buildings and say, hey, uh, well, they had wood, they had vinyl siding, I mean, that's look would just be terrible. I mean, can you imagine going to the temple of the moon with vinyl siding? Who wants that? Um, but well, brought to you by Lowe's. So here we are back at Baalbek, well abandoned. So Von Danigan, a lot of people, you can see, and again, just for, for what's going to be coming up, you can see the square is a little better now. You can see that there's a pattern on these blocks. The trilithons, you can see two of them now. They're over, um, they're between nine and 1100 tons. Just, just these two blocks. And then these platforms, clearly no one's moved that. But the concept is one group of people built this temple. And they went from using 1000 ton blocks to these smaller blocks and then they went from doing whole columns, diorite, some of the hardest stones on earth. They went from making single piece, 60 foot, 50 foot, 40 foot columns to then using little mud bricks. How do you decrement down that single society or even, oh, and if, <laughs> and if no one's noticed, for perspective, there's two people. And there's a third. Um, we're going to get into the technology again. So we've, we started with a little bit of geeky science with the waves and frequencies, but someone's got to move that. And everyone's obsessed with the moving part. You got that old guy on YouTube that's uh, literally using a piece of rock as a fulcrum and moving whole like 300 foot pole barns. And as a redneck, I'm really drawn to that. I'm like, I don't need a skid loader. I need a stick and I need a rock and I'm going to move your pole barn and good for you. But the precision is the issue. It's not just the movement. It's the precision of the work. So when you're rebuilding something and reusing material, just want to point out, you can see these blocks, they had some protrusion. You could say it was a deck, but the reality is that those protrusions, they don't make sense. And you can see a little bit of nubs, but again, you don't, you don't start with a giant block. I think that this fell apart, whatever fell apart and wherever they took these stones above the trilithon, those came from another temple or another location at the complex. And they combined it with the trilithons and the bases and this is Baalbek. So all this is supposed to be separate and on its own from another site. So here we go. This is the quarry for Baalbek. Now I've shown people pictures. This is the stone of the pregnant mother. That's what they call it. You know, I mean, it would, it would feel different if we call it the stone of the bitch and party. I, I, I mean, people would be like, yeah, let's go party on the stone. I dare you to jump from the high point. Um, Baalbek is in the background. This is approximately three kilometers from the site. And again, period of construction. We're going to see this at Gobekli Tepe. We're going to see it with all dynastic peoples. What do we have again? Meg megalithic construction. River rock. Giant, giant well-cut stone that's half-assed in the dirt. Is this, are these uprights because they were part of the construction crane that lifted it? Were they the base to a metal um, crane? We're, we're looking at 
the original location, the original quarry location, and no one in dynastic periods work with stones like this. And again, why? If you're, what we know already is that based on Michael Cremo's really well done forbidden archeology, span we know that anatomically correct humans outside of the theory of it, look, evolution, you can take it as a theory and you can shove it back millions of years. Because the minute we took anthropology and paleoanthropology seriously beyond, uh, natural things were cool, like going, how many shows? Galapagos Islands, Komodo dragons, figuring out that there's the whole idea of the theory of evolution was developed from understanding that things, it's all part of a bio biology that was interesting to look at. But just like art history and pulling up something to go on a mantle, uh, nobody took this kind of work seriously until the mid 1800s. And now right away in the 1800s, paleoanthropology starts finding anatomically correct fingers and bones of humans in layers of earth that are 5 million, 20 million, 60 million, 120 million years old. It's not one or two finds. And so you have Australopithecus, uh, Austral uh, Australopithecus and uh, Homo erectus and fill in the blank. They're living simultaneously with other humans. And we have Neanderthal, Denisovan, mystery 14% human that we now know of all living together. And we have cities at least 60 or 70,000 years old. And if we're gonna go off the super volcano that is dating around 75,000, this could have all been work done 80,000 years ago at, at, at a minimum. And then we're, we're not seeing again, any of the metal work, anything that would have been available. Here, these are original slides. We, we are looking at original work. I mean, this is some of the original plates of photography from the site. And the problem is, is that problematic even to this day. Uh, we were just talking about Arturo uh, before the show started with uh, Arthur Pozanansky, uh, who famously wrote about Tiwanaku and, and went, just went explorer. And he noted that even in the periods that he was going, you had local villagers coming and quarrying stone to build their homes, to build moss, to build um, in, in, in Egypt, it was mosques, Christian uh, churches, oh, just schools and administrative buildings. They were coring off the pyramids and they worry about us taking a rock. You know, it's hilarious. Um, but again, I, I just want to know, I, I don't know what it is. We don't, but what is this? That tall, that tall pillar, again, it, it's upright and it gets ignored. Oh, well, you know, they were coring and Okay, but it sure seems like it was maybe part of a superstructure. And then you have dynastic peoples and work going on around it. Another angle. And, and it's important because these people weren't moving one or two of these. We, we can see from the constructions at Baalbek and the size of the, of the hundreds of columns, the size of the base of the buildings, they were using and moving and cutting and managing and measuring in incredible sizes. So this stone is considered to be about 1200 tons, tons. And the scale of that and what we work with now will make more sense. There's so much construction going on in the Twin Cities. I just stop and creep on all these construction sites. I, I think they think I'm with OSHA and I'm gonna report them for not wearing their masks. So this thing is a classic uh, crane, you can see, you can see the operator and you can see the kind of concrete and the construction. And this is your first look. You can see the building it's going to turn into on the left. That, that, that kind of studio thing, studio loft, the base of all these buildings, they look like this. Society gets abandoned, rain, fire, tomfoolery, shenanigans, at least three St. Paddy's days go by. And how much of this building is left after somebody starts a fire? Harvests all the glass, takes the metal for tools. You end up with just, as this building's going up, there's a couple things here. We, we're gonna look at the cranes, 
but we're going to look at the construction. The modern construction methods start to look like Stonehenge. They start to look like the polygonal constructions and we'll see it. But this crane, completely not even close to being capable of lifting what you just saw. So they start doing some work at the Temple Mount and very important place. Uh, this is also our first dive into uh, not offending particular religions, but the first thing I wanted to point out, this, th this is uh, 40 to 60 feet below the surface at the Temple Mount. They did not know this existed. Look at the rubble at the top of the photo and then look at the construction below. And before we go back to Baalbek, I was obsessively pointing out what do you see in the construction? It's the same, the same bump outs. Forget the squares, but the bump outs, they're the same as Baalbek. And these are just like the trilithons. What you're looking at, that giant block behind her, the University of Eau Claire, you can see the, the University of Eau Claire started measuring these, not too far from Minnesota. Oh yeah. How about some Ludifisk? I'm digressing because I'm flipping photos. So 11 and a half feet by 41 feet. You saw the black and white people standing in front at the ones in Baalbek. This is underground. This is the Temple Mount. It was supposed to be, we all know our biblical stories. This isn't supposed to be built with that, that stone, according to Eau Claire, is 897 tons. You have 11 and a half feet by 14 feet. And what they're not saying is they're guessing in thickness that this one is between 12 and 14 feet wide. That little crane you saw isn't lifting this. And, and again, similar constructions, the squares, nobody knows what the squares are. Personally, I've tried to speculate whether or not they were part of a staircase or something, but I don't, I'm still not positive. So how does that relate to this kind of construction? A lot of people try to chalk it up to it's a different society, but this polygonal wall, like the large megalithic blocks, if you're a society that's lived five, 10, 20, 60 million years, you live through a few catastrophes. If you're building with 100 or 1,000 ton blocks, you're gonna withstand a couple tsunamis and assorted other earthquakes. Because right away, we started doing cymatic construction with, we saw the, we saw the danger noodle building on a giant slab. So what we have is something that we haven't even considered. We think of history as this lineal progression from caveman to whatever. And now we're saying, okay, we may have done that and then got to this megalithic building, but we still don't understand if there was more than one uh, generation of building. So are the people building with the megalithic blocks the same construction, uh, same people, but in the same construction phase? Or is this more complex blocking coming after or for a functionality reason different from the megalithic blocks that we're looking at in the last photo at the Temple Mount or at Baalbek? The issue is the functionality of the wave and frequency use for not just earthquakes and communication, but of the actual functionality of the building in a period where they started with, we know how to build really big. And then was it later that somebody took a wall like this and said, well, wait, we can still use, don't get me wrong, let's use 800 to 100 to 50 ton blocks, but let's make them more complex with more sides and we'll stack more of them, <laughs> but they'll do the same thing. And so here in looking at this, we see a polygonal wall that has all that functionality, the marshmallowing, the, all the sides, you know, super razor sharp, tight together, but we don't see the foundation. This is the missing element that no one's ever explored. And we're gonna get to foundations, but as we look at this wall, we also aren't seeing now the finish layer. We saw a crane with a almost complete apartment building with a construction that is just concrete, but there was siding on this. Nobody looks at this and says there was siding. 
They just think they painted the blocks. They're, what society can cut, shape, and manage these blocks but doesn't know how to put a finish layer on it? That, it's ludicrous. The last elements of a society that's building for millions or tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years would be that they wouldn't have a finished layer on these buildings. So we keep, we have to back up the story we tell ourselves for something that is more uh, realistic. This is uh, Machu Picchu, by the way. And you see the nubs? Same nubs, same polygonal walls, and they also built around corners. So here we are, uh, re really just beating the dead horse here, but this is a construction method that is repeated throughout the world, the engineered soil throughout the world. And now we're not gonna just uh, have to, I, I, we can't deal with colleges and people that aren't willing to see it. Sakse Waman. The stone that people like to take pictures of is the one that's kind of triangle shaped uh, to the right of the photo in the first row. The estimation on this one is it's 800 tons to give you scale. You'd be about this tall in front of this one. They take, people take to take pictures in front of it. What I find interesting about Saxe Oman, and we're gonna to get to the foundational and the, the sexy soil again, they think that this foundational area based on local reports goes down 40 feet. So we're not looking, we're looking at how many tens of thousands of years, is it more accurate then? Do we hit 50, 60, 80,000 years? If you have, and they say it goes down 40 feet, but does it go down to 40 feet to a foundational row or is it 40 feet and then that's where the foundation actually starts? And is that a compacted single material or is it multiple materials? This is something that myself uh, is very interested in core sampling and really looking at, it's never looked at. People went to these sites to find gold, riches, mummies, to suppress the locals from their religious activities. The attempt was made by the Spanish to destroy the structure. They got tired. <laughs> they literally got tired. They couldn't, they couldn't do it anymore. They, they, they tried to blow them up and they just, they, they, they couldn't do it. It was just too much work. and we're just not gonna fast forward. So this is, um, I'm only gonna pause for a minute because this is Machu Picchu again. You see the curve? This is Egypt. Same cut around the corner. This is a single piece of stone and they ended it over here. That's not easy. Why do that? We build with little bricks. And these are 16 pounds, the average brick. 16 pounds is a little brick. But why would you build around the corner like that? So you have the same thing, Machu Picchu, Egypt, and now back to Baalbek. Um, do we know that the dynastic peoples rebuilt things? So here's our trilithons. Here's our weird shaped blocks. <laughs> Look at the size of the people. Look at the big circle. Think plain wooden blocks. That's the bottom of a pillar. That's another bottom of a pillar. Oh, by the way, they do have drill holes in them. They have drill holes in the pillars that seem to have a connecting point for, it makes no sense because they were single columns. But is this one group of people? They literally found blocks and okay, there, there have been earthquakes. So you can see, you can see some of the uh, spaces. That's not how they set them. There, uh, there's a combo of weathering and earthquake. And I know it's a little difficult on the screen right now, but there's an issue with, you can see some of the, um, the blocks that look like the Temple Mount underground. You can see that they were built. So they're just hodgepodging it. They're just, it's a combo of just whatever was left at the site to build our Greek temple. And then we build a big ass story about this being a single construction. And in reality, all we're seeing for sure is the foundation 
that these trilithons are part, and this is part of an original structure. But all this, all this is something else. All this was part of something else. Well, it's hard to move columns. But we, we aren't looking at the original construction. And repeat it again for construction methods. This is Jordan. Extreme weathering and antiquity. We don't have a way to judge uh, the length of time for that antiquity. So that's Jordan. That's the Osirion. Um, what, it's the same nub, it's the same. And uh, also just the mantling on the stone. This is very complex. This is underwater at Egypt. And then look at, look at <laughs> dynastic Egyptian work, weathered stone, super fine finished. Low, the lower you go in Egypt, the more complex. The higher you go, rubble. And then here we go, Jordan. Same, same construction methods for large megalithic constructions. One of the things that's not been explored is how do we date the two sites? Some are above ground, some are underground. Were they underground 50,000, 80,000 years ago, or was there that much soil and sand and shifting? And we'll get into nanoarchaeology in a little bit. This is one of those buildings up close. It is not meant to be identical to the Jordan uh, uh, work, but this is the base of one of those buildings. It's two different concrete beams sitting on a concrete column. And it's important for us to see that in its use. What would be left of, uh, what would be left of Stonehenge if they were support columns? Everything, everyone who gets excited about standing stones and dolmens, and here we are with what is going to be a giant eight story, 10 story apartment building. But what would be left? There is weathering at Stonehenge alone, tens of thousands of years old. I mean, there's, there's megalithic blocks at Stonehenge where you can see through it and people think, oh, that's a natural window. No, it's, it's not a natural window. It, it was weathered to the point where you now have a crack in a megalithic block where you can put your head through it. So how long was it abandoned before someone came along? And one of the big things that made the news last summer was uh, a giant henge was found next to Stonehenge. And the hinge is over, it's almost a mile and a half, almost three, it's almost two miles in diameter. Was that the original location of those stones? Everyone's like, oh, well, we found where the stones are from and we found that they were quarried over here. And well, what if they were quarried and placed in a lar larger hinge and then Neolithic people found it after all the other pieces had earthquaked out and all you have left are just um, a little bit. This is, uh, there's a couple fun things about this. The megalithic gate, I don't even know, Ha Amanga A Maui. So scattered over 700,000 square kilometers, South Pacific, the Tonga Islands, one of more than 176 islands that make up Tonga. Uh, there stands, okay, it's not by the way one, they have more than this. That's, that's a weathered megalithic lentil set section of a wall. That's all that's left. But what do they call it? It's a gate. Must be a gate. It, how do you not, how do you not, how do you, you just stone of the pregnant mother? Uh, Wim Hof said this, I can say this, this is my, my show. I got to meet Wim Hof and I learned how to Wim Hof from Wim Hof in San Francisco. And the man ran up and down the aisles. I had never heard him before. And he's like, fucking demystify. He's like, no, you know what I'm saying? Fucking demystify. You want a fucking prayer? You know, he throws his hands together and he speaks five languages and he does it in Hindu. And then he goes, ooh, there's your prayer. And he goes, fucking demystify. And 
what he says is so important because what he's trying to do is get us to reactivate conscious control of our immune system. And he's doing it by you not applying something fake to it, by you switching on your, your, your not just God given your ancient engineered genetic abilities and to mystify something and call it the stone of the pregnant mother and the gate of God knows what it, 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 it blurs what we're looking at. It's so easy for us to look at this. And, and, and I know I haven't pointed it out, but there's a crap load of, uh, of just the engineering. Something as simple as the trash cans, which are, those are dumpsters, portable generator, crane weights, those are useful when you're building a megalithic chamber after they've weathered for 60,000 years. All this building, it's crazy. This building, I should have gotten a picture for everyone. This building is being put up right now in St. Paul. It's part of a complex that was once the Ford Ranger construction, uh, Ford Ranger assembly plant. It was a, a plant built by Ford for a hundred years. It made Ford, Ran well, it made Fords and then it made Ford Rangers. But that building is going to be about eight or 10 stories made out of wood. And it's, you know, again, nothing would be left. But here we go again. Just look at the stack of columns and picture them as standing stones and meniers. Give them a fancy name. Say druids sprinkled pixie dust on them. Sorry for all you druids. I know it's a big day today. <laughs> can't help it. Um, so clear picture of the cranes. By the way, none of those cranes, they couldn't even come close to lifting those Baalbek stones. We have three cranes on earth, allegedly, that could lift possibly one of those trilithons straight up and straight down. And I don't think the scale of what these things can lift are explained and we're going to get to that. But again, you just have to imagine not building, but deconstructing. Right now, a primitive people have come along and they need the wood for fires. Uh, they're going to use the columns for their Stonehenge. And we're going to build a whole lot of paleoanthropological stories about it. And then you're, you're not going to see it. There you go. It's not even lentil stonework. It's not even as well done as the Maui piece that you just saw. Um, this is hollow core concrete sheets. They come in five foot sections and you fill them with either conduit or whatever you bust out a point. Um, almost looks like keystone cuts, but these are pieces and they're craned up and laid down. And that makes a great foundation for you to plug in um, uh, the, the wood walls. But again, it's, 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 it's important to look at modern construction to really look at our modern past and to understand that this is what they did. And after a great and long amount of abandonment, those standing stones at Karnak, the, 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 the rings, uh, whether it's the Stonehenge that everyone thinks of in England or in Libya or in Eastern Europe, there are henges everywhere. Is it quite possible for dynastic people, uh, Neolithic people to drag those things and stack them and stand them? Yeah, we, we just saw the Egyptians do it with keystone cuts. We just saw a number of other sites where it's clearly been adapted. And we'll see period Incans doing the same thing where they start with the megalithic construction and then they add to the top of it. And this is just driving home the point. All the ancillary technology, something as simple as a cart, a knack toolbox, another generator, plastic. My God, megalithic people might have had plastic. Ladders. I mean, you, you don't think that that's a technology, but that fiberglass ladder over there has a certain weight limit and has and been stress tested on equipment. It's not a matter of just putting fat people on it and then making it fall down. It's literally stress testing. And look at the complexity of that, of that crane. 
could you tell me when this project is done what they use to build it, let alone dig the hole that they started with? None of that technology is there. It's, it's taken for granted that the constructions themselves speak, but it's beyond that. This is a site, here's an anthropological study. Tell me in 500 years if you could tell me that these are garages built for rich people to have cool cars in them. These are literally garage condos. You are looking at a site. In fact, the garage on your left, this garage, every garage has a full kitchen and each kitchen is the size of the room that we're having this lecture in. And for everyone listening, that's big. And uh, they have multiple bathrooms. That, that specific garage for everyone listening on the left has $4 million worth of cars in it. Just the cars. But what do we got in the background? You have a guy putting up a wall on what? A platform. The platform is concrete. And what you can see is they've pre-run the electrical, the water, uh, the plumbing. That, those are stacks. That's where you're going to put a toilet. By the way, um, I got to meet Eric Von Danigan a couple times. And he goes, he goes to, of course, um, the Nazca lines all the time. And he goes, Jared, you know there's drains? I said, what do you mean? And he goes, there's drains. So between the different mountainside um, the different, I'm not talking the monkeys, the spiders, the, the graffitis. I'm talking about the straight uh, piezoelectric quality, straight Nazca lines. Down in the pitches of the valleys between the lines, there are drains. And they are lined with uh, actual tubed drains, which the first season, by the way, of Ancient Aliens, the first season of Ancient Aliens showcases a farmer in South America that keeps coming up with long uh, terracotta-like drain systems that are all across his land. And they match very closely with ones in India and all over the world. But here we have a slab. We have, again, when, when, this, when this vehicle is gone, we've already seen three, four different kinds of cranes. Who's going to tell me that this is the vehicle that was developed and the technology around it used to build that building? Here's a closer look at the slab. And this is important because we're going to go look megalithically. You can see some of the venting. Uh, and for the in-floor, this is service points. The, actually, all these slabs, by the way, all these garages, in-floor heat in-floor heat for all of them. And uh, it was Frank Lloyd Wright that had rediscovered in-floor heat that was being used in, in Korea. And it was Frank Lloyd Wright that reintroduced in-floor heating to America. And every, arch ar every architect and engineer, not all of them, but many believed that the floors would burn your feet and that all the tile would become cracked. And it was impossible to do in-floor heat. So for everyone listening, uh, that's how backward we can get on science. This is a point about supplies again. It'd be really great if you were a Neolithic people and you didn't have to deconstruct a building and all you could do is just take the supplies at a site. And just like keystone cuts, you have a plate in the ground where right here you have, um, th these are all uh, metal rods that are in the concrete. Ancient megalithic builders aren't doing that. They're marshmallowing and almost either, we, you know, the description is, are they agitating these stones? Are they piecing them together in a way that is um, somehow melting the stone? They're, they don't have to do this. But why add the keystones unless it has to do with connectivity? And this, this is just an example also about what you get when you're done. Again, you can see the finished garages on the left, but we are looking at original construction, not torn down, readapted, repurposed, rebuilt on, rebuilt on again, earthquaked, fired, assorted or other conquests and or adaptations by pick a god. And before you know it, you have a completely different building. It wouldn't look anything like this. And that slab might be buried in soil and they might build next to it. So again, same, same construction. This is, by the way, the same construction site, the forward area. You have an example of almost every crane that we use to move things. And again, they're building up the first 
floor, but it's all wood. Ancient megalithic builders would have access to trees that were much larger. Uh, the sequoia and the giant redwoods were forests in the period of these people building. And right now they're using two by fours. Those are nine foot ceilings. Those are 10 foot two by fours. And they're pre-built walls. So they're craning the walls up and they're setting them in place. Carpenters are doing that. You have operators in the cranes, more dumpsters, more equipment. And by the way, they're not even building large slab walls. Those are cinder blocks. Those are each one of us in this room could carry a cinder block. Those are just cinder blocks. And that's our modern construction. And just to look at the crane, that's, again, that crane's gonna be gone and you're not gonna have that. So this is the exciting part because we can't get enough of technology. This is a crane that can be 150 years old. That's made out of wood for the most part. This is in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Cold Spring is from uh, Minnesota. Uh, Cold Spring uh, is a granite company and they are the people who help supply the Empire State Building, First National Bank Building, a lot of our granite, a lot of it, it's been a stone, stone area for years and years and years. And what we're looking at is this is the operator house for that crane. So the little cabin that everyone's looking at on the computer, that is the operations station. And you can see that they're lifting a stone. And the reason we're looking at this is to really give true perspective because it can't be explained enough about getting our eyes and our ears and our minds open to a more advanced human society and how we get back to Tic Tacs flying around and F-22 is not keeping up. And you know, and we, stop, we have to stop thinking of interdimensional space traveling aliens. There are rectangles on the screen. They figured out that they could get a really, that piece of wood is about, it's about this thick. It's, it's a tree trunk, about that. Those rings are in place so that it, when you think about, so think about this, the stone that they're lifting is so heavy that they learned early on that that trunk will twist and break. So they put those metal squares on so that it doesn't, so it helps hold it in place. You can see it here. Uh, you can see them there, there, and there, but also you can see the metal ties. So it's the same thing. It helps hold that piece of wood. So at the end of that wood, it doesn't just twist and fall down. I got to meet the coolest guy that was there. To, he had been retired and he showed me around. Uh, for dramatic purposes, when you go up to St. Cloud, they do a demonstration. They run the crane. These cranes ran all over. They ran in Alaska. They ran all over America. They were developed. They're really smart. And this was, this old quarry uh, is now a park. And here's the flywheel. I mean, here's the wheel at the base of the crane. I just wanted you guys to see some of the technology that they're using in order to make this work. So I thought it was cool. They're, they're lifting up the block and they are moving. Here is, um, I mean, you can kind of see how big the block is compared to the guy, right? I mean, we well, can see the other blocks too, but the operator is guiding it. I'm inside the station. And uh, well, anyway, the, I'm going to go back to that block in a minute. In Siberia, this is a polygonal, this is a, a po this, this is a built wall like Baalbek. That's 3,000 tons. <laughs> this is a 3,000 ton stone. They are separate. They are not geologically broke. There is constructions in Siberia and around the world that are really, really big. Uh, maybe this was the castle keep, maybe this was the capital, maybe this was we're really gonna make a point for this society. Um, so here's another angle of it. So to give you an idea, these, this is like a hundred something foot tree. I'm just, you know, that's, this is not a small block, that little guy was standing in front of it. So those are 3000 tons they estimate, right? Uh, this is the point about our world. 
Uh, here's the trilithons again, some of them. Again, different angle. You can see, see the guy laying on the single column, right? This, these are original plates, so that's why they're doubled. Again, you can see some of the original large columns. Remember that one stone that they had, they had turned sideways in the building? They were just stacking anything they found. They were like children. I mean, just uh, use that one. I got to get home and skin a deer or an antelope, whatever the hell they had. Um, so back to this, right? Here we are, Temple Mount. Same kind of stone, right? We know it's 41 feet-ish, right? Here we go, 1,200 tons. <clears throat> this is the fun part. Uh, does anyone in the room want to guess how much that weighs? Yeah. Any other guesses? No. I like that you guessed. <laughs> That's 25 tons. That's 25 tons and look at the crane that had to lift it. That, that's, um, let's go back. That crane, I asked if it was at the max weight. He said that that crane can lift about 40. So when we say, when we look at this stone and we look at this man and we go back to this, those are stacked. Also stacked. I mean, this is a row, but what was on top? where they fitted with smaller blocks, keystone cuts, polygonal construction. Is it both? I mean, this is a column. This is a busted column. It, it <clears throat> could have been one of the single columns, but it's, it's pieced. And we think it's because of the abandonment currently. But let's go back to, here we go again. Look at the posts. How long until that becomes a manure? How long until that is just a, uh, a standing stone for miles? It's a mystery. It has to do with fertility. I just got, can't, can't stress it enough. So this, uh, this is some of the equipment that's used to build these things, the way we, the way we know it. This rope, that's a blade. The rope is a blade. It runs fast, at, like clay, like cutting through clay. That's what that does. And those hooks, <clears throat> those hooks go into this. And this is gonna be our first backstab at technology and society. These go inside the tops of the stones. They would take a jackhammer so you have a big block and you want to lift it with these hooks. The, the, these hooks here are going to go into the loops of, of, of this. And what you're going to do is you can see the hole there. And what they do is they drill, um, excuse me, they, uh, they drill in at an angle. So in this hole, they drill sideways and they drill the other way. And do you see the bottoms, how they're wedged? Well, they're wedged because what you do is when you're gonna move a block with one of these cranes, you don't wanna drop it. <laughs> Seems like a big point, right? Don't drop it. So what they do is you put in the fatties on both sides and then you have shims. So, they're wide, right? But they've, they've drilled inside, inside the hole. The top's like this big, as you see it, but they've drilled in on both sides. So how the bottom of this key is fat at the bottom, you put it in, the fat parts move out, the shims go in the center. So now 
you're going to put those two keys in and you're going to put them into the hole. You put the shims in the middle. Now you put in the hooks, double hook it from both sides. And now you can move this big ass stone around. That's the technology to move the stone. And part of all of what we're talking about is not mystifying and demystifying our past. The problem is, I do think we need to respect our thousands of years of history. We need to respect every people that have been on the planet because I do think, I keep saying it, I think there is a collective consciousness. I do think there is genetic memory. I do think that there, we don't have 6,000 junk genes. I do believe that what we have is an interconnected society that likely has a genetic and or conscious connection to the point of us being a backup for each other. We can get into the genetics and DNA of that later. But what happens is, is that all, all the buildings go away. The wood goes away. The materials go away. You lose this metal to whatever you want to do with it. Um, and then all you have left are those pieces. And what happens to these pieces after a while? They last longer than the others. They're big, they're heavy, the cranes go away. The material to move these items uh, get quarried off for other buildings. So uh, any looks, Michael, as to what you think, uh, does this, see how fat it is at the bottom? Mm -hmm. And it's rounded in the front? Mm -hmm. Does it look like anything to you? Looks like an ox. But uh, I mean, if you're going beyond that, like, yeah, okay, that's what I'm uh, I did not even set him up for that. <laughs> this is, this one's even older. But that's what happens to dynastic people. You don't have a crane anymore. You don't have a building to build anymore. You don't, you, you don't need the hooks anymore, but all, all you have left, if you're a dynastic person, uh, if you're a Neolithic person and all you did was find one of these, how would it not be a religious symbol? And people like flair. So why can't you add some crosses on it? I mean, that just looks cooler. It, 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 it's, it's one example uh, this is not a definitive. I'm not just throwing it out there because I think this is what actually happened to those keys. But this is a perfect example of there are so many ancient pieces of high technology that have fallen down and then get mutated that it's easy to see a trans uh, mutation like this from its original use. There's an Indian professor. I just saw the video. Someone sent it to me and I, I wish I could remember who. It has, I don't know if you've seen it. It has it's in India and the professor lines 50 people up all facing each other in a line. He makes the first person in the back of the line turn around and look at him. And he does movements with his hands. And then any, and, and literally it's like, it's like this. He does movements, it's practically the Macarena. Then he has that person turn around, tap on the next person's shoulder, has them turn around. And as an example of how history mutates, 50 people later, do you know what they were doing? They went from practically doing the entire Macarena to doing a salute and a handshake in 50 people, just having each person turn around and explain to the last person what the last person did so that no one could see each other, but they just kept turning around and then you have to copy what that person's doing. And by interpretation, 50 people later, you see how history changes. And that, that is a tragedy when we're talking about this. <laughs> and, and we're not seeing that. And we're not seeing it in our genes. We're not seeing it in our technology. And again, the, this is not identical. But how soon before this is the only thing left? And see that one? I mean, it, it, it's not long before you end up with, and mind you, these are freestanding. You can kind of tell from here, there's a cinder block wall, but you can see that these uh, tubes are freestanding underground where they've dug it out and they lined it with metal. And this is not um, untypical. And again, we all, I, I mentioned Ford. 
the amount of technology that goes into that truck, right down to the radio, right down to the Bluetooth, and this crane that's retracted, it's counterweights. Uh, and, and something else about the process of construction. I can't illustrate this enough. There is a temporary wall. This is an OSHA thing. You have to have walls so that people don't fall off until beer 30. And you also have different construction methods. This is a brand new building. But not only do you have single cast concrete beams that have been delivered on site and built off site, you have cinder block. So you can look at a building that may have megalithic blocks on one hand, but like Baalbek, where we have the pieces that seem to have the jutted piece on the front, and then you have the megalithic trilithons, but they could easily be the same period. But again, does it look like Baalbek, the back half of it, and all those other blocks were built with that building, or were they built off-site at a different building, and then they dragged them over and they stacked them all and got themselves a temple? And why did they build the temple as tall as they did? Well, they built it because there were 60 to 40-foot columns. So they're like, well, if the gods built that big and it looks like we got big blocks, we'll just keep, we'll just stack 60 feet of blocks. And so, and it's not that it wasn't an achievement. It wasn't that it wasn't difficult. And they didn't do it with work like that, but they did do it with the complexity and the detail. The work we're looking at for polygonal construction, the work that we're looking at for the advanced ancient past has a fine finish to it, like that polygonal wall. And this isn't the only thing that we're looking at. You know, this isn't, um, this is being stressed for everyone because at the end of the day, we're left with exactly this. Deconstructed, this is the same style building. What do we got? Meniers, standing stones, they're on a platform. There's, did they build the platform in Neolithic times to put this on or did they build it for um, just, 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 it was part of this original massive superstructure. Um, these are for safety so that ironically nobody impales themselves, these little plastic caps. Literally, people do impale themselves on this. So that's a OSHA thing. It's kind of like wearing a proper mask. There's a technology for everything. But this, this case is going to be uh, that cinder block wall. So that's going to be, they're going to set the stones down, and then they're going to fill it all with concrete. And we're getting to my favorite subject, because everyone's not totally asleep yet, foundations we do only so much to build a foundation today to even build a building like this on for the one building to be built for us, hopefully to have put something under it that it doesn't shake or fall down as much, but we don't do a lot. And you can see here from this construction site, a lot of sand, we build in clay, we build in swamps, we build in black dirt, we build in a little bit of everything, but dynastic adaptations, so you build a column like the one you see, and you saw the wires, the rebar, that they were gonna use to build the, the cinder block wall. Here's Gobekli Tepe. This site, when I started doing my research five years ago, 12 to 16,000 years old with organics being found here to 38,000 years old. Now they won't, uh, and my rule now is screenshot everything on the internet because I can't find the organic testing anymore. And again, there seems to be a very fast marriage between alternative researchers and mainstream science. Everyone's willing to say that this is 12,000 years old, but they wouldn't give a date less than 12 to 18, 12 to 16. They kept saying it, 12 to 16, 12 to 18. We found organics. They've only dug up 5% of this site. That's a problem. Giant, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna build a construction site, Actually, I guess I could have zoomed in on that. You can see the first row of blocks, right? They're gonna build a nice complicated wall and I've bored you guys with enough of modern construction. It's practically a pre-licensing class, but um, what do you see between the columns? Does everyone listening online and watching now, does that look like the same builders that built these, these crap walls? Do you think the people who built to built out of the rubble between these columns are the people who cut single piece 
20 to 30 foot single piece megalithic posts? It's a joke. When you look at it like this, it becomes funnier and funnier. So they, they build, we're, mind you, Gobekli Tepe represents one of six sites in Turkey. They've spent 47 years now and they're only 5% dug up. And we're looking at a site that has thousands of years of human occupation. And I don't think the people building this wall are the people, oh, look, look at the little cut. Oh, that, that looks a little more technical versus that platform. I mean, maybe we, oh, can't really see it from there. But this, this site is showing multiple years of occupation and use. Back at it, original use. <laughs> I am definitely not, I am definitely not using the same tools to put this here as that. It's just not the same people. And, and it can't be stressed enough that the people who would have been using that technology would have been doing it for a different reason. And I can't illustrate further the uh, jumps that anthropology makes than I'm, I'm with Russ, uh, the 86 year old retired uh, stonemason at, at Cold Spring. And we're in, we're in St. Cloud. And with delight and glee, he takes me over to this. To this, to this metal, and, and by the way, it's in a giant megalithic block. It's in a block. I mean, it looks like a decent Baalbek building block or like that one that was in that Egyptian temple. And he's like, you know what this is for? And he just smiled. It was the funniest thing. And he goes, so our foreman had a workhouse. Tells me this story. And, and, and if, we were, if we were claiming quick about dynastic Egyptians, you know, we've, remember they sent the robot up the shafts in, in Giza, and then they saw the electric, it looks like electrical points, you know, like it looks like a little metal loop. I mean, we could speculate all day long just on this picture. And he's like, so we work at the quarry and we would build these all over the quarry. And I said, okay, what are they? And he goes, the foreman hated, anytime they called us into the office, they hated if we came in with muddy boots. So we, we always had a drill going. So we drill and epoxy in a, a horseshoe loop so that we could scrape our boots off before we would go into the foreman's office because they would bitch at us if we would drop mud everywhere. This is, and so he shows me how they would do it. He'd scrape the side of his boot and he'd scrape the top. That's what that loop is for. In this, by the way, in that block, well, it's gotta be a 50 ton block. And if you were to find that with that lichen on it, well, it must be something important. It must have to do with construction. It must have to do with the fertility goddess. No, it's for boot scraping. And, and that's the mutation that's happening that we're moving from these large sites to what we are interpreting now as it's got to be aliens. Uh, you know, we, 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 we are as advanced as we've ever been. And it's just not the case. I'm trying to overlap on all this because this is something I've, look, I've looked at all this stuff for 20 years. And so for people, it's not that you guys are, it's not, you guys are definitely all brilliant and smart in your own ways. Everyone's different. Everyone observes different things, but it can't be stressed enough when you're looking at these in photos the, the nubs again, those are not, those, those are the same nubbed construction. And we, we, we have to keep looking at it. So here we go again. It's not as obvious on the Egypt photo, but you can see some of the nubbing. I wish I had a different conglomerate, but we have Peru, Italy, Turkey, I think Gobekli Tepe, but how long has this in Turkey been weathering that it doesn't look like this anymore? This wasn't stacked half-ass. This, this wasn't stacked. Um, I have friends, my, my screensaver is the Temple of Delphi. It looks weathered like this, but with that kind of construction, 
And the same thing, the Greeks said, the gods built this. They built like the, the oracles and everything you see from 300. That whole temple was built by the gods. Here we have the same construction methods, the exterior of the pyramid. You have, again, polygonal blocks, nub, the same construction methods all over the earth. And what's missing? The foundations. We've been looking for mummies. We've been looking for gold. But we don't understand uh, why they were, there's so much put into looking at these uh, polygonal blocks and saying, and, and the subtleties here are being missed. Like just, just that, just that right there. And then how it comes across, it dips it down again and curves out the corner. These are perfectly fit on every single side. The technology for, we're, 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 I'm pointing to the ones in Peru right now for everyone listening. This is uh, a consistent construction method that is so complex and takes so much effort. Do you think those guys up on those cranes and those four, and those carpenters give a crap about how close plumb level or square those wood walls are that they're throwing up on top of those concrete buildings? And these are laser fit. And they're not, they're not this. But again, picture this coming down and not going up. That's, that, that, that's, that's the difficulty. We see this and we're trained to see a building's being built. That's about 30 feet, by the way, for the lower level. So the, this is commercial, the lower space. But I, I like to look at this because you have the same lenteling, you have slabs, um, they're hollowed, but there's lots of constructions. There's flat ones, there's nubbed ones. This one has the nub out the side again and the, the other piece. But again, it's modern construction that we're just starting to mimic. Um, looks a bit like the quarry at Baalbek, right? They're getting bigger now. You can see the size of that crane, which has no chance in hell of lifting that block, that 44 foot long block. But they're not, they're, they're not limited to blocks. It's time to talk columns. That's a 12 foot column that was laying at the same site. That column is 12 feet tall. It's about a foot and a half in diameter. And it took three men, three shifts, 24 hours a day for over 30 days to polish and cut, to cut and polish that block. To, to make that 12 foot column, which is about from me to the end of the pew, to, to, yeah, to where the pew starts, that short column and its base was 24 hours a day over 30 days. So I'm not, I don't, I don't, I, you know, it broke. Every, now, part of the construction, this was for a bank in the early 1900s before Machine Gun Kelly would rob it. And they would come and inspect. This is hand-hewn. So this is done by men with power tools, but they're hand power tools. And they're polishing and they're working on this. I mean, this is nothing. I mean, th this base is like this big. <laughs> and it took them a month and they're not doing it. Remember those three big drill holes of the ones in Baalbek? I asked them about that and they said, oh yeah, it helps stabilize it. It helps keep it from rocking off its post, even though it's been set on. So the same technology was in the ones from Baalbek from thousands of years ago. I thought that was interesting. But this uh, column doesn't look anything like what it would take then for how long would it take to produce a 60 foot column? That's the size of multiple buses, a single piece that is hewn perfectly and we don't have any eyes on that technology. You can see a little bit of the spotting. So the inspector that was, so the building foreman that was working on this bank would come to the site and judge the columns that they would work on. If there were any imperfections that they did not like, they rejected the column. So they would do all this work. And if it had any errors in it that they didn't like, maybe they'd worked on it for 20 days, three guys. And they didn't like it. It got nixed. They had to start over and build another one. And, and, and that's a 12 foot 
foot and a half wide column, not that. <laughs> I, I, I talk about it all the time, but when you see it, it's where you have to start reevaluating. What do you eat? How do you move? How do you relate to the earth? What do you grow your food in? How does it reactivate abilities like Wim Hof? What are the technologies and measuring being used, not only that we're not gonna find because it's dust, but what are we finding in the constructions themselves that are telling us that we have a tens of thousands of year old tale that we're not uh, understanding? Because this is a piece of uh, a metal crane that I wanted to show you because this crane came after the wood one. They got smart because they got better at steel. So this piece represents one of the sections of those cranes, but it's not a section that they were using anymore. They still, the old wood one was still in better shape than the metal one that they just kind of tore down. And I wanted to explain the wheelhouse, how this thing actually works. This is, this is our man operating. These are the, uh, you can see his foot pedals. He has to operate foot pedals. Oh boy, that's really dark. He has to operate from his feet with straps and all these handles. And if you do it out of order, you rip the crane apart. <laughs> and that's for our 25 ton block. And while he's running that, there are pieces like this that I wanted to photograph for people to see because this is a piece that, what, what would you do with it when the society has gone? The, you can take the piece of crane laying in the back, you can take that piece and use it for a million other purposes and you're not gonna have anything left other than what it's sitting on, the stone. And, that, and that's where, where the, the challenge lies with our archeological work. You have a, a metal bit, and yet, depending on petrification or reuse, you can tell from the scale. These are, I mean, these are big ass trees. These are not tiny trees. And we know from um, Stradivarius, everyone could not figure out why he made such great violins or great musical instruments. And it's because of the density of the wood. There was a, a mini, um, freeze for 300 years in Europe. We had a little mini issue with uh, basically an ice age and it caused the trees to grow denser. So not only are we dealing with big trees, we're dealing with trees that may have lived through climates that would also help tell us something about society and the earth. When we once had sequoias and giant redwoods, we would have had a very different telltale if we hadn't been chopping them all down for other purposes. But how are we supposed to discern anything about our high-tech ancient past when this is what we got? That guy has antlers on. Huzzah. I'm not saying, and they're blowing, they're blowing horns. And, and for a period, that's great, but I don't think the people in the wizard robes were building that. That, that, that. This is the, it's not about proving the point, it's about having a final stab at, at standard academia. This isn't funny anymore. Our, our history has technology in it that could cure a number of diseases. I don't even have time to get into Anthony Holland's work, the musician, director, professor that has a private uh, company and has a TED talk of him destroying using sound and frequency MRSA, leukemia, 30 and 40 viruses and bacterias on screen, on video. There's a TED talk. You can watch him do it. This is a society that was using energies in a way that was likely causing unexpected and indefinite lifespans for a people that likely were connected on layers and levels. And again, to get you a little more of the lunacy of what we're talking about, that you can see the, you know, they cut it and it broke. So it's like, oop, do the next one. That's a decent sized blade, right? Um, I wanted to explain the technology for cutting stones. We're like, well, we just have to come up with a logical way to explain this. And, and so we're back to, not wanting to spend a ton of time disproving standard academia, but 
the issue is if we can't start seeing these actually advanced technologies and the UFOs that we see, everyone's looking for some sort of disclosure and, and there's so many people fascinated about ancient history, they have a difficult time seeing the practicality of an advanced human race still being here on the planet that may have survived uh, a fall to the point where when they did come back to the surface and they weren't able to reoccupy the whole planet, Denisovan, Neanderthal, mystery human race, they're all mixing and they're taking over, you know, they're adapting the sites, the Greek, the Roman, the Egyptian sites, and all this technology is washed away, rusted away, and or they've been rebuilding it. Those are some decent, almost Baalbek sized blocks. Um, but this is the, these are the machines that we use now to cut stone. And this looks pretty big, right? Uh, that's about 12 feet. Um, and here's another one cutting blocks the long way. So here we are back. There's an 11 and a half foot blade and this is where we're gonna stop uh, for a quick view. Here, everybody can take a look at that. 11 and a half feet, uh, it had diamond teeth. So it all goes into, I've talked about math, I've talked about frequencies and energies and genetics. Um, I was really impressed with the size of this blade. And for everyone reading, yes, yeah, so they're made with a synthetic diamonds embedded. This blade, according to Russ, was made in Italy. It didn't occur to me until about 10 minutes into talking to him to ask exactly, it looks like a giant blade, like all those ones we just looked at, because they were using the same stuff. Here's the problem. It can only cut from where it's attached down. It can only cut four feet deep. This is one of the biggest saw blades on earth. It can only cut four feet deep. How do you get an 11 by 14 foot by 41 foot megalithic block just saying there's no there's no depth the spin point would interfere you can never get across the surface enough to to cut anything that big so this um there's the teeth and they could be refitted and resharpened and here's something else mind-blowing about ancient technology they did it thinner than this there are ancient quarries that show signs uh, of not Greek or Roman or dynastic use that we know of. They're older and they're a half the width. So I've talked a lot about a man named Flinders Petrie. He was uh, exploring Egypt in the 1800s and he has core drill samples. And, there, and this has been looked at extensively by Christopher Dunn and a number of other people that have contradicted some shows where they're like, we've repeated it by putting a, con you know, we put a cylinder that we've spun quickly and we put sand and water and we, we, we made a core sample. For sure, the core samples that Flinders Petrie at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution was looking at have consistent concentric rings, which means that not only is it cutting, it's the speed that it's cutting at. So not only is it cutting thinner than this blade, but, the, the, and these machines don't do it either. These are just modern, modern machines. And we could talk about cart ruts in Turkey and wonder if maybe where they got a lot of the stone. But th the deal with the saw blades being thinner and the revolutions being faster to, uh, to this day, the core drills that Flinders Petrie was looking at show to be 500 times faster than any blade we have to cut stone, let alone a core drill. And by the way, some of them are four, six, eight, 12 feet long. So how are they cutting them? And, and the key point is, it's a continuous spin. So the rate of revolution, it's all math. It's not an opinion. It's just math. The way they did it, it had to have so much pressure and spin at such a certain speed in order for it to do what it's doing. And there, there's the point. It's just to give you a comp, to, to give you an idea. So how do you cut that? And how do you get it in a single piece and how do you get it flat? And not only that, but Flinders Petrie's problematic view of the stone vases that are on display casually with like mud brick lids is 
you have vases that have necks in them this big, and then they have bodies this big, and some are small, some are big. They found over 40,000 of them in the step pyramid, and they all show revolutionary cuts on a lathe, like they've been cut. So how do you get a blade in the neck of a vase and continue to cut out, a, by the way, a solid piece of stone? How do you cut a perfect vase out of that? And with very fragile, so hardest stones on earth, and they're doing, um, they're doing it uh, in shapes and depths and dimensions. And here's the best part, the consistency on the exterior of these vases, they're, they're, they're perfect. They're within 18th or 16 thousandths of an inch for the ones that they have measured. Some of them are so thin, they cut them. This is stone, not glass. They cut some of them so thin out of quartzite, so fragile that you can see through them. They look like glass. These are the oldest layers of Egyptian fine. These are not the newest ones. So the newest ones they build with mud brick. They're practically squatting. Anyway, back to Baalbek. There's our peeps. So we get romantic about the constructions. We get romantic about the buildings and the idea that there you can get not very consistent, the, the building, you know, the, the stone. And again, some of it could have been shaken out, but they just look like pieces that are from all over somewhere else. And that brings us back to Sakse Waman. There's another 700 tonner. And we're not, okay, here we go. One of these things doesn't belong together. Does, does that look like the same people? It, and, and this is what you're told. We're spending time on this. It's, everyone's got eyes, but we're looking at the, the, the archeologists involved say, the people who built this built that. And they use that for the same building. This isn't a rebuild. They're saying that's the first time and only time around and that's how that got built. It's mind blowing. You look at the complexity There you go again, the, the, they, they, uh, they, the same builders built that crappy rock wall up here. We don't even know what's under that mount, right? So the issue is how are we going to get to archeology span in a way that's actually going to get to some of these answers quickly. And part of it is finding mummies is really cool and sexy, but now we're really to the key point here, foundations. In Minnesota and here you have cellars and basements. <laughs> And this is one of those cases where somebody's sound Let's, hold on a second. Let's see who is not muted. Participants. Um, Mute. Sorry, Tim. Um, how do we, oh, resume share. All right, anyway. So here we are back with foundations. We build buildings and we put them on a single foundation. And I think this is super exciting and on the, on the, on the edge of what could be super cool research. Archeologists, they all wanna find Tutankhamen, they all want to find a really cool mummy, but nobody goes to sites where there's just standing stones left, megalithic constructions, and they don't care about foundations. Given the technology that's involved in building a building, the significance of the layers under a polygonal wall, like the one at Sakse Waman, is super important. This is a tamper. I've talked about them, but I have never shown them to people. That tamper is weighted. It has a gas engine on it. And all it does is rattle up and down. All that does is pound the ground till it's flat and pre-packs the material and they're gonna redo the parking lot. That's exactly what's done for the foundation of buildings. You dig down. If you're unlucky, you have swampy mud. If you don't have a high water table and you're gonna build a foundation, 
you dig a trench big enough that you can tamp the clay, the sand, the dirt, whatever you got, you pre-compact the soil, then you add rock, then you add sand, and you're pre-compacting it the whole time. And then all you're doing is there's a guy walking behind this machine and you're just looking at your clock and listening to the radio. There's no science behind this. They just feel like it's tamped. You can tamp dirt so tight, it, it feels like rock. You can walk on it and you're like, wow, I tamped it really tight. Buildings are supposed to be pre-compacted to 90% before they're built. Then you build what we currently call a foundation. So after you've done the tamper, you put up some walls and you've put in rock, you put in sand, you've tamped it all down, you build a little form, and now you pour in concrete. That's your footing. That's your footing for a modern house, for every house, like 60s, 50s, 70s, 80s, 90s, today. That's, that's why in 100 years you go in grandma's house and it has a fun factor of six and marbles roll in every direction and you kind of feel like you're walking sideways into the dining room. This is what you're dealing with. So for all the technology that we're looking at, what is this building sitting on? This doesn't seem very fun. I'm gonna make it more fun in a second. I'll use hand puppets. This building is allegedly, Saxe Waman, they say that this lower level is 40 to 60 feet deeper than it is now. Whether it's Egypt, whether it's here, whether it's every country that we've looked at, what is that building, what's left of it, why is it still level? What is it sitting on? I know the building, okay, so the building looks all marshmallowy. It's shaped a particular way, but you can picture this now with a wood layer above it. You can picture it with 10 stories, 20 stories, but what is the foundation? Is it a platform? Is it multiple seismic metamaterials? Guess who hasn't looked? <laughs> no one. <laughs> No one anywhere has ever looked. I, that we don't know what this building's sitting on. We don't know what Baalbek is sitting on. Do we know that a lot of it's been rebuilt? Like this section, highly suspect to me. You see the blocks? That doesn't look original. This though, nobody moved that. I would be really, really surprised if anyone ever moved that Baalbek. So just as just being repetitive about polygonal construction being places, you saw those stone spheres that were busted open in New Zealand. This is New Zealand and it's considered sacred. And the problem is, is that you have dynastic peoples again everywhere going, you know, this is our stuff, but we need to do research because you can't have polygonal construction all around the world and we don't know what's in the construction. And so this is Baalbek again, but that's weathering. Now water, I mean, everybody's, if you've ever gone to Europe or if you've ever seen an old fountain, weathering water can just be a bitch. But how much water was in front of that block for, or, or, or just, Sandblast weathering? I mean, it's a combo of water and uh, just open air, but why is that one block so weathered? How, well, how maybe the rest of these blocks were buried for a while. We don't think of ancient people's, so Egyptians, Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, Olmecs, Toltecs, fill in the blank, Etruscans. We don't think of them as archeologists. But if you come across a society, you come across a pre-built construction that's in ruins and one side's exposed, but the rest isn't, there's gotta be a reason that one block is destroyed. I mean, did they wall it in at one point and that was the shark pool? Was that where they put the piranha? Is that where we did the little, you know, and is that why that's weathered? But the antiquity of it is the issue. And building a foundation that is going to hold these buildings up or work cymatically for these constructions. Because I talked to Muhammad Abraham about this. You know, he gives tours in Egypt. He does ancient Egypt uh, uh, research. He speaks and writes and reads uh, in the ancient languages. I mean, he understands it. Uh, tons of videos of him doing uh, work right now. And I've been able to interview him. And I, I explained the, the foundational issues with him. And he's like, Jared, no one's ever looked at that. 
and I, and I always ask whether it's Michael Cremo or anybody that I've talked to, I said, Hey, if you had unlimited resources and money, what would you go and look at? What would you go and do? And I wasn't digging for it. And he's like, I, I want to know what's holding that up. That was, <laughs> he's like, I absolutely want to know what the foundation is of that because the gold and the, and the, and the other stuff is a distraction, which which brings us as we are crashing towards our almost finish line is an outstanding, uh, exciting possibility for resolving all these issues, all of these issues, because everyone has a different opinion, but something that's not line is uh, quantum mechanics, spintronics, and uh, DNA. This is a Paracas. He's a redhead in Peru. There aren't supposed to be redheads in Peru. What are we doing? They're born this way. They are, they have one suture line in their head and I'll show you that in a minute. They have their arterial dissections that go in their head. So where your arterial supplies are to your brain, different than ours. Spinal column, different location. Are the human? Yeah. But why is it that um, molecular biology, uh, archaeology, uh, no mainstream academic institute is a joke. You want to go get a degree? This is a joke. You guys, none of them have tested this. Pick, a, pick an institution. No one's researched this. How? There are thousands of these mummies and skulls. And they have red hair. And there there's some with black hair. And there's other shapes. And they're not just in Peru near the Nazca lines. The work that Brian Forrester has done says that they're from the Caucasus region of Europe. They're Eurasian. They're definitely near, well, not Siberia, they're near Russia. You know, they're in the, the, you know, the, 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 the Crimea, basically. We might be looking at the first uh, hippies. They blew up the world we're like, dudes, this sucks. We're going to wear a tie-dyed shirt. We're moving to Peru. We're going to fish, stick with textiles, get high, and just die. That's what we're going to do now because we've screwed everything for like 2 million years. But no genetic testing has been done on these people. None, except for Brian Forrester, who has at least established that they're from there. And they have at least six or seven DNA markers that Brian has said uh, do not correspond based on their testing to what we know of the human genome. I like to talk about these in my book, which by the way is going through a revision. So nobody buy it. And how's that for a positive? You know, wait for the, just wait, there's more. This, um, th th there will be a new edition out. Um, I, I do want people to wait, just to get a membership to the site. Um, don't, don't buy the book, but in the book, uh, these, these bits and parts are from Siberia and you got to see those giant 3000 ton stones in Siberia. There's a lot of work. Uh, the East and the West do not mix. The East figures stuff out and the West figures things out, but they don't share information. In the nineties, they were looking for new gold and places to dig for gold. And when you're a professional gold mining company, you pay attention to things you sift and find. These gold nanoparts have been judged to be at least 22,000 years old to over 200,000 years old. And they were well-researched until the main researcher, Shock, died in 96, 97 of old age, I think everyone, so don't totally freak out. But the Paracas skull and nanoparts have something in common. And this is where we are going to geek out for our last segment. This is new April 15th, Neanderthal nuclear DNA retrieve from sediments help unlock ancient human history. We are going to read this quickly. Um, they have, I'm going to go down to the full story. The field of ancient DNA has revealed important aspects of our evolutionary past, including our relationships to our distant cousins, Denise Yvonne. And by the way, Denise, there's a reason it's Denise Yvonne, but the different story, different time. These studies have relied, well, <laughs> reptilian hollow earth queen, uh, which store DNA. Okay, so these studies have relied on DNA from bones and teeth, which is how we've done this for years, right? And 
skeletal remains are exceedingly rare. And I just mentioned about two hours ago, just mentioned that they found bones that literally turned to dust and they're like, okay, well, so what? We found a statue that has no head, but we'll stick it on our mantle. So to fill in the gaps, researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, ooh, sehr gut, developed new methods for enriching and analyzing human nuclear DNA from sediments. I will let you guys browse at the article while I talk. Um, and then I'm going to switch it. There's one more page. If you don't have to rely on teeth, if you now can rely on nuclear DNA, like nanoarchaeology that I've been talking about, <laughs> then that means that the Paracas and a number of things that this house of cards, this joke of our history is built on, will... That means the dust around the bones of somebody, melted person, you can now judge their DNA from those sedimentary, sedimentary elements. So what is extracting human DNA from sediments? One of the things that they point out is that removing non-human DNA. So what they were doing was, as they were doing this, um, they were worried that they were going to be accidentally looking at some unknown species of hyena. Uh, they were also studying 150 sediments, right? And so of what they're studying, what's really interesting is that they were finding other animals. And not only are they looking at the DNA for, um, uh, let's see here, scientists, sediments, DNA, other skeletal samples, they noticed a striking trend there's two radiations of Neanderthals. So within this article itself, they're talking about the different kinds of Neanderthals. They, fa they found other animals. Uh, what's significant about this is that they're analyzing in view sedimentary remains of not just DNA, but in an article prior, they've used nanoarchaeology sedimentary remains of the flora and fauna of Doggerland from the ocean where salt water screws everything up. They dug into the salt water, found sediments that showed the flora and fauna, the plant remnants of a whole part of a continent that's been gone at least 6,000 years. You can't hide in the shadow of the joke of the theory that we're in. There is a group of archeologists that might as well be committed to our early retirement community right now. And they can all tell their stories and they can wear costumes like the Renaissance festival. And they can tell us those stories, huzzah. Because this kind of technology isn't leaving room to not explain this. This is a Paracas skull. What's missing? The big ass line that goes right here in the human skull that you, you can't tell me that not only is that a different human being, but that, that human being has to be um, slightly variant in a way where we have to know who and what they were. And this brings us to the premise of my book to begin with. The premise of my book was going to be fictional and it was going to be about military organizations secretly reanimating using DNA from the oldest mummies on earth, which are the Paracas. And the Paracas were going to uh, be reanimated and remember on occasion where they would find ancient lost cranes and technologies and things that we could use. And there would be a handler. And that was my whole story. And here we are with the news from April 18th that Russia is going to clone 3,000 year old dead warriors. And everyone keeps telling me to write the fictional books. And I'm thinking about picking that part back up because you can't, this is truth is stranger than fiction. And isn't it ironic that it's in the Republic of Tuva and it's in Siberia. We have 3000 ton megalithic blocks, nano parts that are found in the soil. That gets better. Um, here, they're, they're, they're going to, uh, since 98, uh, Russian German archaeologists began excavating. So they are now a Russian Swiss archaeological team is being tasked with finding samples for the DNA cloning of an army of warriors. Um, what do you do then when you have technology that can explain um, nanoparts that are at least, now there, there is some evidence that based on the layer of soil that these nanoparts were found in in Siberia, 
These are not an in situ uh, intrusive burial from a crash. These are nanoparts found while looking for potential gold mines. And these are parts that were in layers that were for sure 20 to 200,000 years old. Who was here, what was here, and these aren't the only machine parts that have been found around the world. And now you have suture lined, different genetically built humans that although we will now admit that there's a mystery 14% human race, but they're not Denisovan, they're not Neanderthal, oh, but they're not the Paracas. But, but we have a global human society using cymatics, energies, waves, frequencies, and here's not the only example of nanotechnology being found around the earth that is part of machinery and systems that we don't have access to anymore, which is a perfect transition to trees, which is part of this nano archeology span that we are gonna continue on. The buildings I showed you, uh, they constantly built wood on top of them. Why are humans any different in the past? So when I said they built, if they can build with 1,000 to 3,000 ton blocks, why can't they cut and move giant trees? And in their entirety, there's another person right there. There's two people in this if everyone's looking online. And let me back up. Oh, there, there's some at the base. So Hyperion is a tree that they didn't find till 2008. If you wanna know how backwards humans are and finding dinosaur eggs, this tree is 379 feet tall. They named it Hyperion, it's a redwood. All of our forests used to look like this. We didn't have random forests. If you're controlling cyclopean waves, earth tremors, impact zones, if you're redundantly creating a society that can manage despite terrestrial impacts that they had no control to stop, are you really hedging your bets if you're organizing a tree system sifting a engineered earth system, using stone spheres, polygonal construction and megalithic building and foundations we have yet to realize what they are. How difficult would it be to manage trees um, that would really indicate a society that was managing the earth and terraforming it in a way that was not random. And this is the issue is that people will blow by articles. There's no pictures. I mean, you really want to get nerdy. I mean, this is it. I mean, scientists study have studied sedimentary ancient DNA from sediment deposits in South Southern North sea. I mean, so they've linked, um, this is just a recent disaster, right? Doggerland here, they are talking about it. And they're talking about a tsunami, maybe 8,000 years ago and that uh, the sedimentary DNA remnants, um, they're, they're talking about being able to determine via those DNA sedimentary elements, those trees. And, and therein lies the issue. Between those trees and the soil, and the buildup in dynastic periods, we're not seeing our true past. We're taking remnants in an archeological timeframe that's not acceptable. This is gonna be the hardest thing because I'm saying that archeologists need support, but the system is as archaic. We wouldn't have cell phones today if we moved at uh, technology the way archeology span moves at sites. And it's always, uh, we'll have a new technology. And yes, we're on the cutting edge of DNA, evidence so we can analyze the, du the dust in the picture in front of us has bones. Uh, 18 inches down, you're talking about 1800 years. Uh, two feet down, and, and, but then what about um, movement? You know, the details in nanoarchaeology of being able to send out nanobots and being able to look for evidences of just in the dust of those trees, of the engineered soils, of seismic metastructures, which are now dust and crushed. What are we finding besides something that, are you guys starting to recognize the site, by the way? 
Uh, so this uh, took temp pyramid of the moon, my ass. Sorry, there's a, there you go, pyramid of the moon. Um, so for everyone listening, 99 years later, that's the site. It took 99 archeological years for them to go from that. And what's still not done? They now think that the center area, first off they found tunnels underneath, surprise, surprise, identical to almost to Egypt. But what about all the green grass between the pyramids? I mean, we get this mental picture of, well, yeah, they, they built those and then they just had green grass between them and the sprinklers. That, that th this is all missing structures and we don't know what's under the soil. They haven't excavated it. Or if they have, it wasn't considered important enough. But it took 99 years to produce this large scale result, which, which really is a problem when we have modern acoustics, modern archaeoacoustics. We're going to go see a site today that has acoustic properties and Neolithic people could stand in an empty room that might still exist and realize it has cool echo properties like Chunk and the Goonies and Rocky Road. You know, there's, you know there are characters and there are uh, people that would have easily yelled or screamed and understood a little bit of the ancient technologies and dynastic periods. But to go from large scale archeology span where we're starting with, that's a pyramid. But to now know that that pyramid might be covered in the nano dust, here's the circular argument of archeology. span Well, we don't wanna disturb it until we have a technology that can perfectly excavate it. We are standing on the frontiers now of three things, DNA, sedimentary nuclear uh, analysis, flora and fauna sedimentary analysis and extracting it from salt water. We also have seen megalithic constructions rebuilt, mutated, repaired, but in the dust itself is the dust on this mound, the remnants of a construction that's 800 miles away that over the course of the last 3000 years, this dust itself, do we need to plan archeology span better so that not only are we looking at the large structures, we're looking at the possibility that you could go through the nano remnants of all the soil that's on these properties. And, you know, what if it's, as an example, a partial windshield and the other half of the ancient windshield is at a, a site a thousand miles from here. And as you do nano archeology, span you would be able to rebuild construction and include archaeoacoustics, include seismic metastructures, and really get down to the bare bones. I mean, core sampling can be done, nano parts can be looked at. But revisiting sites that we think we've worked out and applying these new technologies, ironically, I've seen some new build sites that have the Lego sections now. And being able to do this in a modern way to really knock it home. Um, this is actually North Shore, Minnesota, Duluth. That's an old fired hearth. Uh, it fell over. And you can see the foundation that, that, that this home is only 100 years old. But where I, was, I wanted to get to a different picture since we're on topic. And, and this is really in, in keeping with the time that we have to get to some questions. Um, this kind of sums it up. This is archeology. span So it should be a little embarrassing, like your zipper has been down your entire academic career. Embarrassing. On the other hand, it's like we all make mistakes. We all have a working theory, but it's difficult to watch um, the technology is not being employed at a rate where there are institutions that I won't name that have billions and billions of dollars literally in their bank account and they brag about being the greatest um, intellectual institutions on earth when in reality they can't teach people to read, you know, write and arithmetic. And going to a university used to be about learning the classics and having wisdom and not being taught what to think. 
And here we are uh, with, and again, it's such a broad term, archaeologists discover Stonehenge like Stone Circle. Um, th th this is every archaeological site on earth. Local tribes, they don't want to tell you what's really going on. They don't want to tell you what they know. They don't want to tell you because usually, it, you know, their experience in dynastic periods, particularly in colonial era and indigenous peoples have had nothing but, um, you know, Christian churches built on their most sacred lands and temples and their books burned and their people destroyed by disease, among other things. The reality is that just in our last thousand years, we have not had a good track record. Archaeology at the turn of the century was using exploratory rods, literally pounding rebar into the ground. And if it suddenly hit a hollow section, there must be something in there. So it doesn't matter if they just put a steel rod through a skull, like a paracas, they would, it, and some of them had hooks on the end, so they would pull it out. And if they had a little bit of fiber, they're like, oh, I think I found a burial. And they would literally explore by pounding rods along. That's like Dennis said at, at uh, the Stonehenge. That, that's early archaeology. The history behind early archaeology gives us a methodology that uh, at a minimum needs to change. But just from the examples I've shown you today, the Paracas skulls, need legitimate testing. All of us are six degrees away of separation and shouting and talking about this. And if you say you're an expert and you have a degree and you haven't bothered to look into this and you're busy touting theories of evolution and of human history, and you don't have an answer for me for the practice, go home. Go home and don't talk to me or talk about something you think is neat, like model airplanes or whatever your hobbies are. But it's important that we put pressure in the sense of information that we are now aware of. So being aware of nanoarchaeology, being aware that the dust in the ground may contain information that we're going to be able to optical luminescence requires literally a couple crystals. And it has to be crystals that haven't, they're, whatever, OSL dating, different carbon datings, DNA and sedimentary nano bots that go out and analyze every side of every village building that can reconstruct the original temple of, we, we think of these things digressing and we think that we can't rebuild something like this. Because if that was once like this building here, if, if that was a building that was what was ultimately going to be taller than the building next to it, this, this building's actually done and it's about eight more stories. But at the end of the day, what are the chances in hell other than with nanotechnology that we would be able to send out, send out a flight of nanobots that could bleed into the soil uh, we already had, by 2008, we had nanotechnology that could, was wirelessly controlled. We're talking atoms in size that could enter individual human cells. So how hard would it be to send out a trillion nanobots to piece together a building that has turned to dust and floated 50 feet away, 100 feet away, or were they carried away? There's only so much you can do if there's only dust. But when all you're left with is a megalithic column, uh, we have a lot of interpreting to do before we say what it is. And in order to get there, I think everyone who's listening can contribute. Part of it is it's not separate to reactivate a genetic ability like inflammatory control. It's not a separate issue that waves and frequencies are not just used in the buildings, but they must have connected. There's a reason we know being barefoot is good and connects to the earth. Well, it's not just the earth, it's the engineered soil. And it's not just for growing, it's for communication. And if it's not just for that, then what are the ideas that connect us globally back to this fully functioning society that is half buried, half underwater, and has been so mutated, we can't see a support column for a bridge from a summer solstice event with druids. Therein lies some of the issues. And now I think for the time, other than uh, wheelhouse, things that are gone and recycled, the plan now is to open it up for a couple of questions because this is um, as much as I could say in two hours and 45 minutes, is everyone doing all right? <laughs> Question, Michael? Very 
quickly, uh, we, some of us are aware of Edward Learskin and his creation of Coral Castle down in Florida. Now, one of the oddities about this particular fellow is that he was building this particular uh, site all by himself, and there were some very large stones involved. Now, yeah. Of those who were able to kind of peek in and get away with doing so, they were seeing him working with uh, a levee system wherein there were three pieces of uh, wood that would come up at the top and the way that he would gauge it was obviously from the caliber of the, um, the internal pieces that he was using, but it was a very simple construct. That being said, he also wrote a book called, I think, uh, Magnetic Current or something along those lines, where he started to describe his interpretation of the Earth's magnetic fields and how it might relate to some of the objects that he was moving and perhaps in simple ways to say he was canceling the phase and uh, essentially allowing these these uh, enormous blocks to lose their gravity. Uh, what are your thoughts on something like that in the way that perhaps some of these ancient uh, civilizations may have moved around some of the larger stones? And with that being said, keeping in mind that Edward had mentioned many times that he had figured out uh, some sort of secret along those lines. Yeah, it's so interesting. I got to go to Coral Castle for the first time a couple of years ago. And I did see it and it really looks like he carved up the slabs and then they almost were tilted. Like each section of the walls, they look tilted up in place. And he was a logger and he understood how to move heavy things really well. And uh, there was some, I did see a good video personally on the technology that would have been related to the cantilevered weight systems and what he could have used. And then there's always the story of, Oh, you know, he floated it and the urban legend of the children watching him with the stone, uh, the cone shaped tools and that he used that kind of technology to float or levitate the blocks. I do think levitation, I mean, it's not a belief, it's just levitation's real. And the idea of using blocks, like in this photo, they're using blocks that we can manage, but how do you move a 3000 ton block? And if you do it, the same technologies you would need mathematically, like we have the YBC tablet for spherical based math for if you were using Egan values and if you were building with 3000 ton blocks to move those with just a loss of weight would be a hell of a lot easier when you're shaping 15 sides of a polygonal block. But that's where I like to describe. And again, I wanted to focus on um, the building side of it, but I have digressed on synesthesias, different human abilities. There's at least 25% of the human population that mixes their colors, their uh, sounds, their smells, and can like literally see two people like hug and they can feel the hug. I mean, they can see things ge geometrically in their face. And the way I describe it is imagine having a building plan for a site that's not an architectural drawing, but it's your favorite music that you like to listen to. And because you're a, you're a synth elite, that you literally show up to the job site and there's a giant stone. You have all the anti-gravity machines you want, but when you look at that polygonal block and all the sides, the way you know how to shape that block is because you're listening to music, just like brain and trainers that uh, can run beneath music. You can get apps now that have brain entrainment, alpha, beta, theta, whatever you want to focus on. You can have them run uh, below your frequency of whatever you're listening to. Imagine being able to throw on, I'm going to say Led Zeppelin, and you're in front of a giant megalithic block and all you're doing is listening to the music, but what you're seeing is because you're a synth elite, is you see a section of your tie-dye shirt is perfect. Imagine looking at a giant megalithic block and someone's here with a tie-dye shirt. And then you're carving the stone for the polygonal fit and you're just shaving away the blue. You're shaving away the red and you are listening to your favorite music. There's no plan. You're just able to see and measure and take away and carve out so that by the time you're done with that block, it fits where it's supposed to fit. But it's not because the way we crow mag then look at it is, well, you know, we get to the end of this wall in this photo and we have to knock a block in. First thing I'm gonna do is try to hit it. Even though it's concrete, I'm just gonna be a grunt and just try to push it in. These people are not cutting one side of a 15 by 11 by um, Temple Mount size megalithic block going, Oh, you know, I need, I need another, I need another inch because some of the control points on those cymatic blocks, 
they're, they're this small. You can put a finger up to them and they go the entire length of the box and they're inside and they're this big and they're stone and they're perfectly fit. So what are you doing? You're like setting the block on there and going, oh, it feels pretty tight. That's not what they achieve. They achieve perfect fit. That's not done by a construction method. So not only anti-gravity, it's they're projecting or finishing. Cause the other thing is no brainer is you melt the block and somehow you get the shape, but, the, but there's precision in how they do it. And one of the other things that we're looking at as I'm writing for my next two books is I th believe the polygonal shape in the walls has to do with the frequencies that they're dealing with, not only that they're communicating with, but within the ground and with what they're dealing with from local earthquakes or impact points. So they're dealing with a polygonal shape that's gonna flex and mute and or work defensively with the waves and frequencies in that area. I think there's general accountabilities with, um, uh, I could, let's see if I can go back. Um, I'm going to have to, I wonder if it'll just flip back. Oh, that's Hyperion. Oh, that's the ley lines. Didn't get to that. Oh my gosh, I'd have to flip back through. I should just, I don't know how hard it would be to flip the other way around. We'll just go to the first polygonal wall we see, but there's no way. Um, no, nope. I was skipping that polygonal wall. Well, these are all polygonal blocks. But the, um, and you know, from an antiquity standpoint, side note, it's like, look at the, look at how that thing has been weathered or fried. Um, the, to connect these blocks on all the sides that they're connecting on, and then to lift them in place and to keep them level, uh, the, the technology is tremendous. And it's just not in reference to the stone. So whether they're levitating in place, I mean, Coral Castle looks like it could have been practically done. I hate to say it, but it looks, it, it, it look, you can see the carve marks. You can see where he cut them. Um, people have built some weird ass stuff all on their own. And remember guy who moves pole buildings. I mean, you start throwing, you can start using some diorite marbles and I don't know. It, it does look like it's practical. It's impressive what he did. Uh, there's a swivel door there that I think is like, yeah, 60 or 80 tons. It's ridiculous. And it's on a swivel point. Oh, by the way, um, a lot of doors in Egypt and a lot of these polygonal places, they had swivel doors. They did. And so how does that work? And there's so many different side points that we can talk on, on the technologies, but have I seen ball levitation, a sound levitation? We, we can do that. We have that technology primitively, but we have it now. But now that we have DNA uh, sedimentary research, you could magically like Merlin, visually holographically reconstruct. And here's the other thing. Think about a road being built and then you crush it up into a bunch of pieces. And then if you crush it up to a bunch of pieces, eventually you grind it and eventually it becomes a big pile, which I was going to focus on today too, but ran out of time. And so now you send out a bunch of nanobots who say, well, this little piece of rubble connects with this little piece of rubble. How long would it take a quantum computer? Even though we have fast computers now, how long would it take a, you know, 50, you know, I don't know, 50,000 ton pile of ground up mile of freeway to be reconstructed nano for them to go from crystal to two crystals to a piece of rubble to till they literally rebuild the road. And then what happens when that road was crushed up? Because when they crush up a road, it's a good best example. Everyone drives roads where you see them crushing up the road and then they create a big pile. And what they do is they recycle it into concrete again. How hard would it be then to recycle that back to the prior road? It, like, is there enough fracturing left after they remelt it or after they reconstitute it to a third road? Would you be able to reconstruct a building like this? That is missing, by the way, do you see the window? See the bottom of the window? That's a window right there. So again, we're looking at a construction where all the wood's gone. And how much of that wood turned to dust and when we stay here at Sox de Woman, 40 feet down, how much of that was still there? How, how much of that wood is in the dust? And, and are we gonna wait 100 years to look at it? Just saying. Anyway, sorry, I'm supposed to have questions, not keep, not shutting up. Have you done any, any research on the world exposition of buildings, especially from the 1800s, maybe even 40 or 50 years? 
That's been like a big thing now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the World's Fair, all I can think about, by the way, on the World's Fair is that stupid lore. Epi- I, by the way, I like lore. It's the f- about that psycho that built the murder mansion during the World's Fair. That's all I get stuck on, squirrel. Um, I like the worst murder ever, if you don't count tyrants and emperors, but this guy built a mansion during the Chicago World's Fair. And it had like the world's largest carousel and they built all these buildings. And the question is, what do I think about the world's fair and about those buildings mysteriously uh, being destroyed slash burned slash, is it that they were built for the world's fair? And the question goes as far as Seattle and the questions are, were there buildings already here that were so advanced and pretty and nice that they had to be destroyed to account for the world being new and there was no, um, I don't know. The, so I do historical remodeling and I deal with buildings that are a couple hundred, 150 years old. And um, I don't have any evidence on it. You haven't gone through the site for that? No. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that it's impossible. So a lot of the buildings I worked with, like on Summit Avenue in St. Paul, there are some very large stone buildings that are so impressive the whole buildings were built for like in their day like one the blair building in saint paul and cathedral hill was built for like three hundred twenty four thousand dollars. and when you look at it you're like this thing's a castle it's huge and it was built with a level of craftsmanship that you know like coping a corner for wood trim uh guys that were doing it 60 70 80 years ago could coping a quarter means you're literally taking almost a paper thin piece off the back cut of a 45 angle you're not just cutting a 45 angle on a piece of wood you're taking a coping saw and you're scratching it out so it just butts perfectly up against another piece of wood they're simple simple techniques they're not simple but they but now they're really complicated if you can't straight straight cut something into a corner it's mm, all done and so now we have these buildings like the world's fair where it's like, yeah, we can't build that. Well, we, we literally have a time frame. So here's, it's not a counter. It's just a side point. The empire state building was built. If you ever watch a show on it, I I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the St. Cloud where we showed the cranes and where we were looking for um, just the cold spring supplied the granite for the empire state building. That building was built one floor a month. They, they finished the Empire State Building in 13 months. Those are, they talk about the world's greatest generation. I mean, we're at the American Legion and I'm looking at pictures of World War I, World War II and Vietnam and, and just everything that this American Legion is here to represent. And the reality is, is that they say world's greatest generation. It was that generation. And what kind of badass stone cutters, workaholics, By the way, they could drink them. They're having a sandwich and a beer on the job site. And they're working high high girder work. And they build the, I mean, people who haven't seen the Empire State Building, even if you look at photos, they built that in 13 months. The World Trade Centers go down and it took them what? 15 years? What a joke. I mean, 20 years? What 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 a piss on our history. There's what I really think. No filter. So do, do, do I think that they could build the world's fair in the time they did? Yeah, they sure the hell could. But do we have that capability now? We have a can't do attitude. We need a mayor can, not a mayor can't. That's, but, but there's the issue though, is that the buildings are so ridiculously impressive. And you look at that and you're like, um, so you guys built that in a couple of years? And then for some random reason, you burned it down. You disassembled it. Nobody would want to go there again. You couldn't find a wedding venue for people. That wouldn't work for you. And they destroyed it. And then we have buildings like that. And then, yeah. And then the story is about San Francisco. It's like, how did it go from like zero to like so many buildings? That's that's definitely been a, a thing. But I don't have, I don't have eyes on it. I, I, I know how those we're well within the construction methods that I repair, modify adds giant structural supports, add or move walls. Like if you ask me to take off a really weird section of this building, but add on to it in a significant way and how to support it and how to um, make it cantilever, I can do all that. And, and if I, and, and, you know, to, to explain 
the actual buildings and their constructions. I've been watch. I have looked at the photos and I have seen it. it is on my radar, but I I'm trying to write work now that includes who doesn't want to talk about nano archaeology? Yeah, soil, <laughs> and that. Yeah, I don't know. Any any anything else? My question was why isn't there more um, material testing on spheres? Yep, you're right. There's no materials testing on. So geopolymers is a big subject on this. Like, are they concrete? Are they made out of an ancient geopolymer? But uh, the material testing, even on these stones, why are they using the why are they using basalts? Why are they using quartzites? Everyone's like, everyone uses quartzites in computers. Why are they using these three particular kinds? And there are videos of them, like uh, uh, Yusuf Awan in Egypt again and Mohammed. They were doing experiments with mini little. They look like voltage conductors, and they were they were they were putting voltmeters and they were running currents through these systems. And these materials, like the stone spheres, they have layers. And not only are they layered, but what are the measurements of the interiors? I'm guessing that the exterior shapes and the interior, con the conical chambers, these are not natural. Okay, the idea of a natural concretion, rolling around and just making that these are not natural concretions. And, and we have found, they've been doing testing, there's been more European scientists open to this where they have found like there's a bay off of uh, Spain that is ancient and it's no longer a bay, it's kind of swampland, but they've done testing. They're like, this is weird. There's a bay that represents an ancient wall that is almost, they describe it like Teflon. It is made out of an ancient geopolymer of some kind. It, there's no barnacles on it. It's not some secret old, you, you know, World War II submarine base. It is an ancient megalithic harbor wall that doesn't let anything stick to it. It's perfect. And there are geopolymers and material sciences that need to be looked. Forensic geologists, uh, physicists, uh, nanoarchaeology, it, I mean, and how you specialize in it is going to be all the rage. And more importantly, I'm hoping to get to maybe not this site. Some are managed by governments and some are on private land. Like the, the stone of the pregnant mother is on private land. The reason anything gets done there is because it's privately owned. We're about to go to a site that's privately owned. The only reason America's Stonehenge has had archaeological work going on it for 70 years is because Dennis Stone and his family has been in control of it for that long. And so sites like what you're saying is, okay, the obvious point, and I think it's a weak point at this point of why people don't do more DNA testing and everything else is because it's intrusive. They think, well, you got to break it to do it. Yeah, you got to crack a few eggs, right? So if it means, like, literally, we're staring at very advanced stuff. So your question is should be everyone's question. We're looking at very advanced material sciences that are laying in ruins. We should know what they are actually doing. And we should be experimenting with the frequencies and to get measurements on it. And so all the subtle, uh, I, I don't care about hubristic, collegiate, Neanderthals. I, I, can't, I can't slow down for that. So there's the school of Kemet, um, uh, there's research institutions in Egypt, in Russia, um, here. There's independent, um, like Dr. Gerald Pollack, who discovered the fourth phase of water. He has a research institution that he founded because he just gives a whole analogy of, you know, if you got a lot of people who think the world's flat, well, one, you get burned, and two, you certainly don't get funding if you're going to prove the world's round, which was a thing. So there are men like Gerald Pollack and women that are around the world choosing to do alternative research. And I'm not pointing this out because I'm hoping one day that big, you know, big 10 schools are gonna figure it out. This is a joke, they've missed the boat. They can catch up or they can quit. But this material science research and the work that's being done. Um, also, Dr. Joseph David Ovitz, who invented geopolymers, he's done research at Tiwanaku. This is Saksay Woman, but at, at Tiwanaku, they've found that some of those cast H blocks or whatever, there's some solid information that they might be geopolymers. So they mixed up concrete, created forms. And, but again, we're looking at what's left of what's not been quarried away, of what's not been uh, dug and uh, you know, used for someone's little house or used for a, a cattle ring or um, for farm animals. So you are 100% right. The material science research that's just starting to be done and has been done 
is limited and it, they get to turn it into whole shows like that bay there's a whole show on it and they just they're like you do one little bit of actual research and it gets monetized and which is good but there's not enough eyes on it there's not enough like this site that we're looking at uh well, well why aren't you digging and and it's because there's no sexy mommies you know nobody cares about the foundation of this building i do Everyone should go away from this and going, you know, no one's looked at the foundation. It's like, oh, some of the, no, no, no one, no one has done core sampling. I don't mean randomly stick a drill in right now. Do exploratory archaeological test pits. Get to the foundation of what looks like one of the original megalithic corners or sides. Get the test pit. Keep all the soil because we now know nanoarchaeology is a thing and we don't want to lose. Like literally, you're going to need drums. I think one of the biggest businesses to get in would be one, have franchised universities, set up universities where you spend your entire 10 or six year degree at a site. And instead of a hundred years, it's your crew's job to manage and sift and nano and material science research, your kilometer of information. And then work with the other groups within your school. So instead of worrying about you, your school having 90,000 people, your school could have a quarter million. And 50,000 of them could be at this site. 20,000 of them could be at this site. You could assign kilometers that eventually your nano research, like I said, your half windshield that you guys discovered in nano sedimentary bits over here matches this construction over here. And then somebody else might figure out that that didn't used to be a windshield. It used to be a glass bottle. And that material science research could be platted out. And these institutions could be going at these sites where instead of 100 years, we could be establishing this kind of information being done like every day in archaeology could be groundbreaking and exciting in a, not that it isn't but you know it's that those are the differences those material sciences are absolutely where it's at and it needs to be scraped or scratched god knows they blew enough of them up so i guess we should go over to america's stonehenge unless you we can talk more any one more anything so then let's see for everyone listening. Let's see. I appreciate everybody being here. It looks like um, we got everybody in and that's going to wrap it up folks. We are going to go over to America's Stonehenge and that is going to be the end of it. We 